24-year-old business owner, Rachel Kale, and her husband, 23-year-old electrician, Brian Kale, say former friend, 28-year-old Aaron Whitten, borrowed their car and returned it damaged. Order, all rise. Yeah, this is case number 301 on the calendar, in the matter of Kale versus Whitten. Why has it been sworn in, Judge? You may be seated. Ma'am, have a seat, please. According to the complaint that I've read, you loaned the defendant a car because he was in dire straits. And you said he could borrow yours until he got one that was supposed to be forthcoming very soon. Is that right? Uh, for two weeks, we told him he could borrow a vehicle. And he borrowed your car for two weeks. He kept it a lot longer for, than two weeks. By the time you got it back, it was pretty well trashed. Mm -hmm. Correct. So you are suing him for... $5,000, a little high for the kind of car that you loaned to him. The car was a 12-year-old car? Correct. Okay. So were they very nice to you to lend you the car? Yes, they were. And why didn't you take care of it? I did take care of the car, Your Honor. I did well, extensive... Well, let's, 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 start, let's start with the windshield. The windshield was broken while it was in your custody. Yes, ma'am. Did you fix it? No, ma'am. I then could not get it take, fixed. Then you didn't take good care of it. Ma'am, the extensive amount of what happened was not in my control. I don't care what was in your control. Again. Um, the car was in your control. The car was in my control. So then why didn't you fix the windshield? Because I was not, I was not working at the time. What so happened what you're was saying to me, it was your responsibility, but you didn't have the money. Ma'am, there was seven days notice. I was getting a threatening call from the plaintiff, the, ma the lady, had given me a call saying to me, demanding that I have to come up with $300 within four days. How she long did you keep the car? I've had, I had the car for two months. The car sat for a month in my driveway because it had a broken windshield, Your Honor. Why didn't you return the car after two weeks? I don't know. Why? You are you misled, ma'am. The, the correct. Did yes, you call for the car? the car many times, and he was saying that he was going to be getting another vehicle. Um, he had purchased it. Uh, he should no, have it in a few days. Don't speak. Um, and we called back, do you have the vehicle? No, I don't. Uh, that deal fell through. I, I just don't have that. But I'm getting another car, and I'm buying a motor separately, and we're going to be putting it all uh, together, and then you can have your car. We still didn't hear about it. Then we tried continually calling and calling and calling and calling, and he wouldn't answer the phone. Um, and then we finally, one evening when we did get a hold of him, we said, we will be there tomorrow morning. And he had called us early that morning, oh, the windshield's been smashed. Okay, so what are you no, going to do Honor. about it? No. I'll tell you just a second. We, we gave him adequate time to, from when the car was, the windshield was smashed, which was roughly the beginning of September. When had you um, given him the car? We had given him the car around the June 20th of 2000. So it's longer than the two months that he's saying. That's over three months. Uh, we picked up the car. We had to go pick up the vehicle on September 25th, on a Monday, after I had to pay for the... Um, vehicle to be repaired as well as we were also threatened by the defendant stating that if we show up on the property that his girlfriend is a police officer and that they will have friends from Dearborn come and arrest us. That is not correct. What are those Honor? tapes? Um, this is the tape showing that he did say that they would have us arrested. What's the other tape? Um, and this is the tape of some of the damage done to the vehicle. That I'd like to see. Um, Your Honor, may I say something? In time. Yes, ma'am. This is me trying to get into the lock. He broke the lock on the car. This is us trying to start the car in park, which he damaged the vehicle, no longer starts in park. Here you go. We tried it a couple of times. It doesn't even turn over. Nothing happens. Uh, when we took it to the Ford dealership, he had broken the neutral Brian. safety switch uh, with the drive shaft. And then when we go to start it in neutral, that the vehicle stalls as soon as we start it, if you can get it started. You can also see we had a Ford radio in the vehicle. Um, that was given to us from a friend, and I have a statement from her um, regarding that they had given us a radio because the vehicle was the radio was... taken out when you got it back. Yes, okay. there was no radio in it. Um, he'd also broken the seat to the chair. As you notice, the other chairs reclined, and this chair here is when you sit down in it, and when you lean back at all, it goes all the way back to the back of the seat. This is where the radio was located at um, prior to when Aaron had stolen it, as well as he also stole other minor things that were in the trunk of the vehicle at the time. Plus the windshield. Yes, plus the windshield. You have the he's also the done damage. damage. Yes, I've got damage to the engine that he's also done. The vehicle, he drove the vehicle with no oil in it and burned the engine out. He blew out two tires on the vehicle. There's, they're worn to the steel Just belts. Second. Just a second. You didn't take pictures of the tires. Because we can't get, un I can't get underneath the car. I'm eight and a half months pregnant. I won't fit, and neither would my husband. 
But I have oh, estimates from the Ford dealership and Just things showing that. Did the car have two flat tires when you picked it up? No, but you can see the steel, when you wear your tires down to the steel, the steel belts in your tires are... Let me see the estimates okay. without the tires. Mr. Whitten. Yes, ma'am. You picked up this car sometime the latter part of June of yes, 2000. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And you picked up this car because you needed it for work? Um, let's technically, I picked the car up from the defendant's sister's house, drove it to his parents' house, parked the car. His sister was living at his parents' house, so she couldn't have Just answer lived my anywhere. question. Yes, ma'am. You wanted to borrow this car, I said, because you needed it for work. Is that right or wrong? It's correct. Good. Just answer my question. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. What kind of work do you do? I am, well, I'm a, I'm a state certified mechanic, ASC certified, and I was in the roofing union doing sheet metal. And did you work? Were you employed in the month of June? Yes, ma'am. Were you employed in the month of July? Half of July. I had injured my knee and I was not able to work. Until the injury, you went to work? Yes, ma'am. So you drove this car for approximately one month? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. It's scary that you read my mind. Do you know that? Known you a long time. When they just fall all over themselves, it's just such a pleasure. Even the smart Alex, you know? It's just such a pleasure for me. Your Honor? Don't speak. Okay. You borrowed somebody's car. You drove it for at least a month. You drove it every day to work until you hurt your knee. And you return it to them in a condition that is completely different from the way you got it. And then you say, Your Honor, it's not my I, fault. May I please tell my side of the story now? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I was sitting with my with my witness as a police officer, my fiance, on their couch watching a movie. If you want to know the correct movie, it was American Pie. I don't I give a rat's behind what you were watching. Judge Judy continues in a moment. Listen to me. I have, I Mr. have Whitten, told them. Mr. Your, Whitten, your just Honor. listen to me. Don't try to shout over me. You can't do that. And later today, I heard a clink noise and looked down and the explosion went off. Boom. Huge explosion. Real cases, real people. Judge Judy. Rachel and Brian Kale say former friend Aaron Witten owes them for car repairs. Go ahead. Rachel, the plaintiff, pardon me, I'm sorry, had said, Aaron, you can use the car as long as you want. That was real nice. Yes, it was. The reason, uh, reason why I think it was being real nice is because I have gone over there an extensive amount of times and helped them. I don't, don't, don't go into what's okay. in their mind. They I said received the car with damages. When I first met the plaintiff, me and him went hunting. I don't care it, about... Listen to me. It falls in for the point of the, for your material. The neutral starting. Mr. Kale had to pull his shifter down to start it every time. That was a lie. That's not true. The stereo was stolen from their house. It was in a Kenwood or an Alpine. I cannot remember correctly. was stolen. Plus with some Just other a stuff. Is what you're telling me when you got the car... It did not have anything in that hole. No, ma'am, nothing. No, nothing was in the hole but the radio, the letters from the lady who had given us the radio to put in there because the radio was the stolen radio prior to the one that we had in there. The radio is sitting in their garage on a, a chair. So he is absolutely right. There was no radio in the car. That's what I, no, it was in the trunk of the vehicle and he stole it out of the vehicle when he had our vehicle. Listen to me. You have no loss for the radio. You didn't buy it. Somebody gave it to you. Yeah, but it, and if I'm not we so have sure. to replace it, we I'm have not to pay over $400 for that radio. I'm not sure. Well, if you I'm look at the sure. estimate from it. That's not what I'm not sure about. I'm not sure that you left the radio in the car and that he stole it. What's next, sir? So um, far you got off the hook for the radio. Yes, ma'am. The charging light came on. When I picked up the vehicle, we had to jump start the vehicle. He also said that the battery light does stay on. The reason why the battery light stays on is because the voltage regulator unit was freezing inside the vehicle. Check engine light came on because it has a bad O2 sensor. It had an idle ignition sensor. Why didn't you bring it back to them? Listen to me. I have, I Mr. have told Whitten, them. Mr. Your, Whitten, your just Honor. listen to me. Don't try to shout over me. You can't do that, sir. No, Your Honor. I'm you not trying to shout over you. Good. But what I am then, trying to tell I am trying to tell you my I, side of the story. I'm, you're almost ready to go. <sighs> If you have a car that you borrow from somebody, and it has all the troubles, sir, that you say this car had... They know the troubles, then, Your Honor. They knew about it. You're interrupting me and you're ticking me off. <laughs> Pay careful attention to me, sir. Normal, reasonable person. And if your girlfriend is a police officer, she's heard the expression of reasonably prudent person, right? Yes. 
If they borrow a car from somebody and the car looks as if it's having real trouble, they return the car. They say, look, I drove it for a couple of days. I see it's got lights on and I don't want to be responsible if anything goes wrong with it. So I'm giving it back to you and I'll find some other way to get to my roofing jobs. They don't drive the car for a month and then say, the car had a lot wrong with it, therefore anything that happened to the car isn't my fault. That's what a reasonable person does. Okay. And if you did not act responsibly, you have to be responsible for the consequences of what you do. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, um, you may certainly... I, may I finish my... No. I have some other w evidence. I mean, they got to describe their evidence. I should think I should No, be well, there's no way that they're going to get $5,000 award from me. They for could even I'm serve speaking. $400 for the cars. I am speaking. So was I. I... So were you? I was rudely in interrupted charge. twice. I never rudely interrupt. I start to talk. It's my courtroom. You have to stop. That's the way the rules are in a courtroom. Doesn't the called rights too? Yeah, you have whatever rights I give them. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of fifteen hundred dollars. Please I excuse you, Mr. Bell. They were lying. They knew the problems of the car. They tried getting some outrageous thing. This is a classic case of somebody trying to get something for nothing. At least now everyone gets to see what Aaron looks like, and now they have to know never to lend him anything because they won't get it back in the shape that they lent it to him in. And now the next case. All parties on Buisdorf versus Gagnon. Step forward, please. 33-year-old wildlife technician Frederick Buisdorf is suing former friend, 37-year-old landscaper Dave Gagnon for throwing a spray paint can into a bonfire. Frederick says the can exploded, causing third-degree burns. You were at a bonfire attended by a lot of people. Is your claim that the defendant, these are my words, the defendant, while acting like a complete fool, threw a paint can into the bonfire, which caused you to be severely burned? That's correct. You want him to pay for your medical bills and a substantial amount for pain and suffering? That's correct. When did this incident occur? October 7th, approximately 6.30 in the afternoon. Where was the bonfire? At my brother's house. He had just recently moved into a place. What time had you arrived at, the, at your brother's house? About 6 o'clock. 6 p.m.? That's correct. And what time was the unfortunate event which caused you to be burned? Shortly after. I wasn't even there, about a half hour. So it was about 6.30? That's correct. Now, Mr. Gagnon, what time did you arrive there? Uh, approximately the same time, Your Honor. 6 o'clock? Yeah. Had you been drinking before? Yeah. How yeah. much? Um... Probably about a six-pack of beer. Judge Judy continues in a moment. I vaguely remember it, Judge. At the time, I was pretty intoxicated. So, so you I... really don't know what you did? Real cases, real people. Judge Judy. Frederick Buersdorf says former friend Dave Gagnon owes for injuries he suffered when Dave threw a can of spray paint into a bonfire. Dave says he didn't do it. Now, what prompted you to pick up this paint can? I don't know. I've seen it, and I... Put it in the fire earlier. And How it, much earlier, sir? About an hour or so earlier. You and said it, you arrived there at 6 o'clock. This incident happened at 6.30. So well, I'm not too sure about the time because I really didn't, didn't get the pit, you know, didn't look at a clock or nothing. So you threw a paint can into the fire and nobody was hurt, I assume, at that time? No. And it is your defense that you did not throw the paint can that caused his injury? Correct. Do you know who did? No, I don't. There was a lot of people around the fire. How many people? Probably about 18 people. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Brewsdorf, tell me about the exact moment when this paint can exploded, and we're going to go through the events of what happened afterwards. Okay. I uh, recently got there, stood in front of the fire, was talking to some people, conversing. I heard a clink noise and looked down, and the explosion went up. Boom! Huge explosion. Brought my forearms, my right face, all of my fingers, my wrists. First, second, and third degree burns. I have pictures here, too. I'd like to see the photographs. Uh, how long were you hospitalized? I was uh, in and out treatments, debridement, every day for 13 days. How did you get to the hospital? A friend of mine that was showing up had brought me to the hospital. I went r right into the house and immediately started putting water on my face and arms for about 20 minutes or so. And when my friend showed up, he took me to the hospital. They didn't want to take me to the hospital. They said it wasn't bad. Who's they? Uh, the defendant and um, some other people that were there. It didn't look that bad at first. Did you speak to the defendant after the explosion? Yes, I did. What was the conversation? He was sorry. What did he say to you? I didn't think the pink can that I threw in was going to do that. I didn't, I didn't mean to hurt you. I'm sorry. He said that to you? Yes. You remember that, sir? 
I vaguely remember it, Judge. Well, why would you have said that, sir, if you hadn't thrown the paint can? Because I was pretty, at the time, I was pretty intoxicated. So, so you I, really don't know what you did? Mm -hmm. You knew enough to say sorry. Yeah, I did. I knew enough to say sorry, but I wasn't, there was a lot of people there at the time, and there was bottles being thrown in. A kid threw a bottle in there, was poking at it with a stick. It blew off and took a chunk of his head. I mean, he was bleeding. So it, it could have been anybody at that present time that threw it in there. Did you hear anybody else apologize to the plaintiff like you did? No, because no one else, everyone, as soon as that happened, like Ricky had no friends after that. So I went by his house and I, you know, apologized. That's if what I happens did. when you drink too much. <clears throat> Mr. Brewersdorf, you indicate that you have a witness with regard to this incident? Yes, I do. Nick Burke. Would you step up, please? Tell me what you observed. Um, standing there, I seen Dave move towards the fire, drop something in, came towards me and uh, asked me, do you hear that? I said, what is that? He said, a ball bearing. And I said, uh, what do you mean ball bearing? Ball bearing for a paint can. There's a paint can in the fire. And then I look up and then, bang, blew up before I could get the words out to warn anyone to get away. There was a bunch of people standing real close. He was the only one that got burned bad, but it could have been three or four different people that were standing next to him. Thank you. Can I see your medical bills, please? Who is this gentleman with you? That's uh, Scott Stebbins. He's a good friend of mine. He's my witness. What does he want to tell me? Uh, Your Honor, I was standing right next to Dave, and I did not see him throw the paint can. I was standing right next to him. <coughs> and if he would have thrown the paint can in, he probably would have warned somebody. Your well, Honor? That's just... Wait one second. Yeah. The facts. Your conjecture of what he would have done or what he might have done is totally useless in a court. You understand? Yes. Did you see any of the other 18, 15 or 18 people who were at the bonfire throw paint cans into the fire? Not paint cans, Your Honor. Paint cans is what I'm talking no. about. Paint cans. No, they were throwing bottles. So the them. only idiot that you saw throw a paint can at some time was the defendant. Earlier that day. Well, it had to be within an hour because he was only there, according to him, for a half hour before this incident happened. But when he did throw that one in, Your Honor, that yes. one exploded. And we knew that it already exploded. And then later I understand on, that. somebody else threw another one in. Well, you don't know that, sir, at all. The only person of the 15 or 18 people at the bonfire who you saw throw a paint can at some point was the defendant. Is that right? That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. Sit down. Judge Judy continues in a moment. Mr. Bruisdorf, I want you to describe for the defendant what it feels like when they do the debrement of burns. Tell him. You have open skin. Open skin, it's bleeding. Every time they scrape it, it bleeds. It's excruciating. They tell you to take more pain medicine, but it doesn't work. What kind no of pain what. medicine did you take? Percocets. I still felt every inch of it. You understand, sir? Yes, I do. Judgment mm -hmm. for the plaintiff in the amount of $5,000 as requested. Thank you. Parties are excused. You may step out. 35-year-old artist Matthew Jones is suing his ex fiance 36-year-old dog trainer Kelly Bell for an unpaid loan to buy a car, the return of an engagement ring, and damage to his property caused by her dogs. Order. All rise. Yeah, this is case number 413 on the calendar in the matter of Jones versus Bell. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Parties have been sworn in, Judge. You may be seated. Folks, have seats, please. Mr. Jones, according to the complaint that I've read, the defendant, who was your former girlfriend, then your fiance, owes you for certain things, according to you. You say that while you were either engaged or dating, a car was purchased that you paid for. Yes. How much was the car? $1,623. Okay. And that while the car was in her possession, being used by the defendant, and the two of you were together, you maintained the car. So when the car needed repairs, who took it in? I did in the beginning. We moved to Little Rock, mm -hmm. and I was gone 10 hours a day, and I entrusted Kelly to make the uh, maintenance. Uh, so she took the car in to be repaired? No, she didn't take it in to be repaired. The car henceforth died. The, the motor seized from lack of attention, okay. mechanical attention, and, and it's dead. So? So is your romance. Tell me about this loan for $1,623. We had an agreement when I bought the car that she would repay me 
This was the agreement from the beginning of our relationship. No, no, just tell me about the car. I don't know. The car was, I will purchase a car if she reimburses me. That's not true. Shh, just it, is, it is true. When did, you purchase, the repay when, did you, purchase, when did you purchase the car? I purchased the car uh, for fifteen ninety nine. And when did your relationship eventually terminate? Officially terminated Thanksgiving last year. The repairs, the upkeep on the car was paid by you? Correct. From May of 1999 through November of 1999, how much did she pay you back on this alleged loan? Zero. Why didn't you discuss it with her? I did, many times. Yes. And what happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. But, I talked. And yet, and yet you continued to pay for the repairs? Correct. Even though she wasn't paying for the car? Correct. The car now is useless? Correct. Well, you don't get much for $1,600 for a Mercedes. How old a Mercedes was this? Uh, I believe it was a 69. What year? It was in 1970, and he paid $1,000 for it. It was a donation car. And here's he paid, the receipt He paid $1,000 for, for the car, Your Honor. Let me see. There's the purchase. Just a second. When did you buy the car? For $1,599. Where? Uh, from Memory Lane. It was a donation car. That's not, the date's not correct, Your Honor. It is. That's the receipt from Memory Lane. Who went to pick out the car? I did. Where was she? At home. How come you didn't go with him? Because he was going to stop by and look at the car after work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go with him and spend all day sitting in a car from 7 a.m. in the morning until 3 or 4 in the afternoon. So he went by himself? Yes, ma'am. What kind of an arrangement did you have with regards to paying him back for this car? There was no arrangement. At the time we moved to Little Rock, we only had one vehicle. I was not working because I did not have a car. And when he bought me the car, there was never, it was a gift because I wanted to go to work. Did you start working immediately after you yes, purchased the car? Yes, ma'am. No, she didn't. How much later? A uh, little over a month because okay, her niece so and nephew moved in and she had to babysit them for okay, a month. Okay, so let's say a month. But within a month, she went back to work. Part right? time. She went to work. But she didn't start paying you back for the car. Did you ask her to sign a note for this car? No. Your Honor, he... Shh. I did not. Why not? Because at the time, she's my fiancée, and I trusted what she told me. I don't... No. Mr. Jones, do you think that if you got married, she was going to give you back this money for the car? Yes, I did. I believe she would at least start contributing money to the relationship, which no, she that's never a different, did. that's a different thing. Contributing money to the relationship is a different thing than paying you back on a specific loan. So it was what you're telling me that you believe that were your engagement to have developed into a marriage, she would have still owed you this... Sixteen hundred dollars. Yes. That was the agreement we had made. I don't believe that. Let's get on to the other things that you're suing her for. You're suing her for the return of the engagement ring that he's entitled to. You yes, understand yes. that? Yes, ma'am. The engagement was broken, and my judgment, an engagement ring is given in contemplation of marriage, and if the contract is breached, for whatever reason, whoever breaches it, he's entitled to the ring back. So? Yes, ma'am, I agree. The ring was lost and stolen six months before we even started having any problems. It's not true? true. No, yes, no, it's it not. Is. It is true. No, she, she said she <laughs> lost the engagement ring in December. Before, before she moved out of the house, she informed me a month before she moved well, out. That's what I'm asking you. Yes. That's what I'm asking you. Before the relationship was terminated, I had she came him. home one day and said the ring was either lost or stolen? Is no. That what you, well, how did it happen? So no. We ended the relationship at Thanksgiving when she stranded me at the airport and left me there, and when she picked me up, she got drunk. That's why I ended the relationship. I don't it was care why I ended then, the relationship, Then sir. she told me after this, several weeks after this, that she had lost the engagement ring. And she did not tell me when she lost it. She may have lost it six months before, but she did not inform me of that. Well, didn't you see her not wearing the ring? I did not. I didn't ask her about he it. He asked me several times, Kelly, where's your ring? No, I said, I'm looking true. for it. She I never, think she I left never it at work. It was it. stolen at work. I know it was stolen she never, at work. Why, how could it be stolen? Someone stole it off her finger at work. How can up you until not? Then, up until then, I had never seen her take it off. Up until when? Up until the time she told me it was gone. You hadn't noticed it not on her hand? Did she I did wear? not. I mean, I'm not talking about... The Hope Diamond here, because according it was to you, a one carat platinum diamond ring. How could you not notice it? Listen to me. Excuse me. Whatever it was, you got a good deal because, according to you, you spent six hundred and fifty dollars for the ring. Is that right? That is correct. Six hundred and fifty dollars for a one carat platinum diamond ring. I want to know where you do your shopping. I'm going. There's the receipt. Can I have it, please? Okay. 
Then you claim, Mr. Jones, that she owes you for some damage to your property that was done by her dogs. You want to tell me about that? Well, that's, there's a lot of vet bills that lead up into that, yeah. I'm not so, interested in the vet bills. Yeah, her dogs chewed up a couple pairs of my work boots, a Christmas gift I received from my grandmother the year before, and a carpet that I had purchased. Were you living together at the time? Yes, we were out in the house in Little Rock. So? You expect her to reimburse you for I that? I only expect her to reimburse me on the item she said she would. She was responsible for the dogs. They were her dogs. Real cases, real people. Judge Judy. Matthew Jones says his ex fiance Kelly Bell, owes him for an unpaid loan and damage to his belongings caused by her dogs. Matthew says Kelly also owes him for a lost engagement ring. Are you telling me you said to her, you have to replace these boots because these are your dogs? Incorrect. That is not what I said. That I didn't not think how, so. That is not how the conversation transpired. Well, how did the conversation transpire? What transpired is I've got destroyed boots. I'm upset. They're so? very expensive work boots. Yes. Kelly volunteered to reimburse me for them. They were her dogs. I never approached her with, hey, you owe me. I've never said, hey, you owe me, ever in this relationship. All I'm asking for is what we agreed on orally that she would reimburse me for, for personal bills I incurred maintaining her. Mr. Jones. Because she's living with Mr. me, that Mr. makes Mr. me Jones. responsible for, for Jones, her car. You're angry. I'm very, I'm hurt. Well, you may be angry, you may be hurt, and all I can tell you is what I've said to many women who are usually standing in your place with the guy on this side. You're really much better off for yourself to put a period and get over it. Now, I think that you are absolutely entitled to $650 from her for the engagement ring. I'm going to tell you why. If through her own negligence, unless she can show me a police report where she filed a report that the ring was stolen, the ring was misplaced, if it was misplaced at all, due to her negligence. And you shouldn't be out that money. I am not persuaded, however, that the car that was purchased was a loan. Then why Nor would I buy a car? I already owned a vehicle. You bought a car because the I two of you... I would not buy her another one unless I was going to be reimbursed. I don't believe that, Mr. I'm Jones. The I'm the one telling who you. was working at the I'm time. I was you. the only one providing an income for both of us. I was paying I'm every absolutely bill. Absolutely right. And Mr. she Jones. needed to get to work. She Mr. refused Jones, to work. Mr. Jones, you are... And she had to come you're up with a vehicle. You're speaking and I'm speaking. I can tell you only one thing, sir. I can't hear you when I'm speaking. Because when I'm speaking, I only listen to one voice. What you just said to me further emphasizes the fact that you didn't expect at the time to be reimbursed for this car because you said to me, at the time I purchased this car, I was supporting the entire household. She wasn't working. She had no source of income. I wanted to get her working. That's why she got the car, because she couldn't get a job unless she had a car. I do not believe, and I am the judge of the facts in this trial, that there was a valid agreement for her to repay you for this car that either you paid $1,000 for or $1,600 for or the bills to maintain the car. According to you, she had absolutely no way of repaying that money at the time that you bought the car. As far as the dogs are concerned, that's sort of foolish. People living together with an idea of getting married. That's not the dog, what I'm suing for Anna. on the dogs. I am suing for vet bills, money I had to pay to the vet to maintain the dog's health. I'm not, I, I didn't Don't even, do it. You don't don't let, do it. You don't let someone you love dogs die because they can't afford to did pay the dogs. Did you buy the her dog. the dogs? No, I did not buy her the dogs. Did she bought the dogs herself? They were free. They were mutts. Who brought the dogs home? I, I drove in my car to pick up one from Little Rock. The other one I got as a stray from a gentleman I worked with So the I answer is you brought the dogs into the house? No. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jones. So, so I got to suffer? No, just, just because, answer just my question, sir. You brought the dogs no, into the house? No, I only brought one dog in. She carried the other dog in. <laughs> Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $650 as indicated. I believe she owes you for the ring. Miss Bell, you're well out of it. Oh, he's excused. You may step out. He beat the dogs in the head with the boots that they chewed up. And that's all I have to say. Trust no one but God in your animals. That's the only comment. I didn't bring up any dirt. I didn't bring up anything about that. I just wanted what she promised to pay me back. And now the next case. All parties on Jerome versus Gray. Step forward, please. 
30-year-old computer support technician, Michael Jerome, is suing his ex-wife, 28-year-old administrative technician, Christina Gray, for an overpayment of child support. Christina is countersuing for attorney fees and alienation from their daughter. Mr. Jerome, you and the defendant had once been married. You have one child. You have a daughter together? Yes. Who was eight? Yes. For a period of time after you were divorced or while separated, your daughter lived with your former wife. More recently, after a lengthy custody battle, I assume, you were awarded full-time custody of your daughter. Yes. There was a time when child support, which was being paid to the defendant, was coming right out of your check. That's right. And your claim is that the money continued to come out of your check after the time that your daughter came to reside with you on a full-time basis. Yes. So you want to be reimbursed for the overpayment for child support. In what amount do you believe you have overpaid child support? Uh, $642, I believe. When did your daughter come to live with you on a full-time basis? Christmas Eve, 1999. And do you have pay stubs to show child support paid after that date? I have the accounting from the child support. I'll see it. All right. The defense to his request for the overpayment is, in fact, he still owes you some money. Yes. In arrears. That's correct. I'm looking at this, sir. Do you still owe arrears on the original order? No, I don't. When I was awarded custody, the judge made it clear that he was awarding uh, attorney's fees in the amount to offset the arrearage, and we would have a clean slate. Well, let me see that order where he says that. Let me see. Oh, well, that's very easy, sir. I don't know why you're here. Because according to the printout from the sport collection unit that you've given me, you did, in fact, pay, pursuant to the income deduction order, after your daughter was in your custody, an amount of $642. Yes. That's clear. It is also clear from what you have given me that you are thousands of dollars in arrears on the original order from when your daughter was living with your former wife, right? And right. what the court has said, yes. Uh, it says total billed, $13,000 and change. Total to date collected, $9,172. So even according to this, giving you credit for the $642, you still owe her over $4,000 in arrears. That's not right. Well, that's what this paper says, sir. The judge ordered the, there to be a zero balance at the time of the transfer. Show me, Show me where the judge said that there's a zero balance. Take a look. Well, that's a different order. That's a good order. I don't know how you managed that. The judge must have been very angry with you because this order says that the petitioner, that's him, uh -huh. has incurred $5,043 in reasonable attorney's fees and that he is in arrears of approximately $5,043. Petitioner has fully paid and satisfied, therefore, the judgment for child support up to and through April 1st, 2000. End of case. So he must have been angry at the protracted nature of this case for some reason. In any event, you owe him $642. That's the overpayment. All right. Now, let's get to your counterclaim. Ms. Gray, you're counterclaiming $5,000 for mental anguish and lost wages as a result of endless court appearances and mediations. Correct, Your Honor. I don't think that you get paid for that, do you? Your Honor, this is nine years of ongoing court battles that have got nothing to do with anything but him being angry because I left eight years ago and taking my daughter. I assume that there were periods of time when you were not visiting with your daughter, is that right? Yes. And were those periods of time during which there were court-ordered visitations? Yes. Ms. Gray, what I'm telling you is I'm an old family court practitioner, and there has to be some very serious circumstance before a judge will transfer custody of a child from one parent to another. That's what my attorney told me, too. That's why he was so confident we wouldn't lose Chelsea. 
Well, your attorney may have told you that. However, what I'm telling you is, when it appears that the child is being deprived of an ongoing and meaningful relationship with one parent because of another parent is frustrating orders of visitation, after a while what happens is the judge says, I'm going to give you one more chance, and if we don't follow through with it, you're going to lose custody. And your attorney says to you, that's never going to happen. They're never going to take your little girl away from you. Does that sound a little bit familiar to you? <coughs> Very familiar. Right. Never mind because, he because denied that, the visitation. Because aside from serious abuse or neglect, that's the only reason that judges will take a child away from one parent who has been the custodial parent for years because that parent is frustrating the relationship with the child with the other parent. Judge got fed up. You count the claims dismissed. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $642. That's all. Please excuse me. Step out. 31-year-old homemaker Michelle Loftus is suing her neighbors, 33-year-old customer service rep Cheryl Earhart, and her daughter, 14-year-old Robin Earhart, for stolen items, damage to her apartment, and damage to her truck. Order. All rise. Yeah, this is case number 91 on the calendar in the matter of Loftus versus Earhart. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Vice President Swarney, Judge, you may be seated. Young man, have a seat, please. Ms. Loftus, your complaint is that you hired, I assume, this young lady. Yes, ma'am. To do some house sitting for you and take care of your cats. Correct. Right. And your complaint is that when you came home, your house was pretty much a mess. Some things were missing. And in addition, there was evidence that someone had driven your truck. Yes, ma'am. And you believe... It was either d the defendant or one of her friends. She admits to it, yes. Okay. You're her? I'm her mother. Why don't you have a seat? How old are you? Fourteen. Fourteen. So you're really suing her mother? Yeah. On what day did this incident occur? April 29th of this year. You did work for her on the 29th? Yes. And what were your responsibilities on that day? To water plants. Um, make sure her cat was taken care of. And how long were you supposed to stay in her apartment? Um, she told me she wouldn't be back till late night, so she just wanted me to be around there to check on her cat and I could stay there, spend time with her cat. Okay. What time did you arrive? Well, I had went there in the morning. Give me some time, an approximate time. It was probably around 11. And how long did you stay? I was there for like... 10, 15 minutes. Okay, when did you come back? Uh, about 4.30. Okay. You came back at 4.30, and when you came back at 4.30, were you alone? No. Who was with you? My two friends, David and Ben. And how long did you stay at that time? We stayed there about, I'm guessing around 7.30. So you stayed through dinner time? Yes. You order in dinner? No, I made dinner. Where? At her house. Whose food did you use? My mom's. Well, mine, essentially. What do you mean? Explain that to me. I went to my house, and I grabbed some steak and the seasoning and everything like that, but I made it at her house. You went back to your house to get the steak yes. and stuff. And you left Ben and David in the house? Yes. And by the time you came back, how many other people were there? There was two people in the house. Just Ben and David? Just Ben and David. How many people in total were there that evening? Just Ben and David. So just the three of you? Yes. Just a minute. Okay. So you had dinner? Yes. Did you clean up after dinner? Yes, I did. Then where did you go? Well, we had dinner, and then we were talking for a little while, and then they were saying... Look at me. They were saying to go to their friend's house or have their friend come pick us up. So Look at me. We, we called their friend, and they came and picked us up. And they didn't go inside of the house. They came outside of the house. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you know about her truck? Her truck? Well, my friends had needed to go home to take a shower or something. And you left this out. You mean your friends David and Ben? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the only way I could think of to get them a ride, because they couldn't find a ride with anybody, I found the keys, and I handed it to them, and I said, well, we just take the truck. We're only going to be borrowing it for a little while, and we'll bring it back and put some gas. They had to take a shower before or after they ate? Before. And for some reason, at 4.30 in the afternoon, Ben and David both had this urgent need 
to get clean, right? Yes. Yes. And I assume that Ms. Loftus does not have a shower in her house. Yes, so she that does. They, so that they had to but go... But they didn't have their own clothes there. They weren't going to wear her clothes. What was wrong with their clothes? They were dirty. They needed to take a shower, and the only way I could find them a ride was with her truck. So they used her truck. What time did they leave with her truck? Like, maybe an uh, hour after we got there? Half an hour? I don't know. 4.30, 5 o'clock, they left with her truck. And what time did they get back? Like, an hour after? All right, now, Miss Loftus, now that I've finished with her, tell me what you found when you came home. Um, I had furniture out of, the, out of place, um, food droppings on the kitchen floor. Um, the bathroom door was closed, and so I opened up the bathroom door, and there's a lit candle in my bathroom, um, and out runs my cat. So From my, the bathroom? Yes, ma'am. Um, there was claw marks from her claw on the bathroom door when she was trying to get out. Um, there was... 12 phone calls on my caller ID from, I'm assuming, her friends. And after this, that's I received, was receiving um, several very obscene and threatening phone calls from her friends. Um, and I believe that's how they got the phone number was that day. Um, I didn't realize that my truck had been taken that day because, like I said, it was late at night. And we didn't take my truck that day, mainly for the main reason is my truck was um, very, very low on oil. I encountered another neighbor the next day who asked me, she said, you know, who was driving your truck yesterday? And I said, what do you mean who was driving my truck? Well, there was a bunch of kids that got in your truck. I know you don't have any kids. And so I turned around and went back home and I called her. I said, you need to get over here right now. I want my keys back. And I hung up the phone. Um, later, I went to go to her house. And that's when I thought I'd calm down. Maybe that her mom would be home because her mom is very seldom, seldom home. So I went over, um, went to knock on the door. And uh, there, was a, there was one of her boyfriends standing out there at the door. And I said, uh, where's Robin? And he said, she's not here. Don't worry about it. And I said, are you the one that drove my truck yesterday? And he goes, uh, he said, it, that's none of your business. Okay. I said, well, then I'll just go call the police and we'll settle it that way. And I left. Just when I got home, I hadn't even picked up the phone to call the police yet. My phone rang. It was a boy's voice. And he said, um, if you call the cops on Robin, you're going to be sorry and your truck will never run again. I went out and I did look at my truck. And there's several dents and scratches in it. Um, there was a half a tank of gas gone. And there was at least 70 miles driven on my truck. I have uh, photos of my truck. That I want to see. Okay. Um, and I also, included in here, there's also some photos um, of the wall. There's some dents in my wall, one in the hallway, one in my bathroom that's, that are up further on the wall. And there's a cigarette burn on the carpet floor. And I do have the police report. I'd like to see it. Okay. I have a map also that shows the distance that she admits to driving. What do you mean she admits to driving? Did she in ultimately the police admit? Report, yes, yes ma'am. Oh, in okay. the police report she admits it, and so I map Let's that see. out for Let you if you'd like to police. see. Let me look at the police report. Who's Jason? Jason? Who's Jason? One of my friends. One of the friends who was there? No. Jason wasn't there that day? No, Jason was in California that day with his Ooh, dad or his that's mom. That's interesting. One of those. Jason wasn't there. You're lying. No, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Judge Judy continues in a moment. There was some sort of um, sexual activity that went on on my bed. When teenagers have an empty house, that is a prescription for trouble. Real cases, real people. Judge Judy. Michelle Loftus says she hired neighbor 14-year-old Robin Earhart to watch her apartment. Michelle says Robin and some friends damaged her home, stole personal belongings, and took her truck for a joyride. Now you can stand up. Your Honor, may I see them? Yeah. One of the other things that I found in my house, um, there were several items missing out of my dresser doors and my jewelry box, um, a pair of diamond earrings. Um, I had some other things taken, but one of the other things that I found was that there was some sort of... Um, sexual activity that went on on my bed. Miss Earhart, when did you first find out about this problem? I had come home from work and Michelle met me pretty much at my car. She was really upset about what was happening. Did your daughter initially admit to you that she and her friends drove the plaintiff's truck? No. She had said that she did not use the truck. Right. So initially she told you she had not used the truck. Right. When did she finally admit to you that she did use the truck? 
It was probably a few days later. We were confronted by the police. Mm -hmm. So then she admitted she was involved in using the truck? She told me that they had used the truck, but... What do you mean, they had used the truck? What does that well, mean? Well, whoever was with her at the apartment, that they had used the truck, but that she wasn't involved. She wasn't involved? Mm -hmm. If it's true that she wasn't there, she gave him the keys. She just told me she gave him the keys. How much more involved can you be? Excuse me? Can I speak? When I'm ready. You were entrusted to go into somebody's house and to perform certain tasks. Instead, you abused that privilege because you had an empty house. And when teenagers have an empty house, that is a prescription for trouble. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. Prescription, especially a teenager with an attitude. And she's got an attitude. She, she didn't have this. Her and I had a really good friendship. Well, she'd come over, we'd talk. She'd tell me kind of, you know, a little bit about what was going on with her. That she had broken up with her boyfriend. She didn't. She kind of took my advice. She said and broke up with him because he was kind of abusive. And which boyfriend is this? I don't remember what his name was. Um, so now she had a couple of new friends. Now my next question to you is: She's 14 years old. So what you're doing is you're really suing her mother for, not for negligence, because this is not negligence on her part. This is an intentional act, right? Correct. Right? Yes, ma'am. This is a criminal situation. And in a criminal situation, there is a different standard. Okay. So my question to you is, do you believe that her mother knew or should have known about her propensity for committing this kind of intentional act. She should have known. Why should she have known? Well, and not you. You never had any indication that she would act irresponsibly in your yeah. house. Since this has happened. Talking about before. Before, no, I... You knew nothing? No, she's always been very nice and polite to me. And, by the way, who are these two young men? Uh, these are two of the kids that live in the complex and they actually saw the, some of the, all the kids that she had, because she had a lot more in the apartment than just the two boys that she said. I'm absolutely positive that she did. Um, and they also saw her driving my truck. Who saw her driving the truck? Step up here. Tell me your name. Mel Blood. Tell me what you saw on April 29th with regard to the plaintiff's truck. I was playing with a couple friends, and I saw her get in the truck, and... So who get in the truck? Robin. What else did you say? I, I saw her running, her and her, some of her friends run up to Michelle's house, go in, and... And how many people was she going in with? I saw like five. Anything else that you saw? No. Have a seat. Thank you. <coughs> Tell me your name. James Blood. James, can you tell me what you remember of the 29th of April? Well, I seen the trucks and everyone sitting on it. Everyone that entered her apartment. Was sitting on the truck? Yes. How many people did you see enter the apartment? I didn't see them enter the apartment, but there was at least five sitting on the truck. Mm -hmm. Did you see anything else? No. Sit down. By the way, have either of you two boys have ever had any difficulty with this young lady before? Well, we we're, were helping someone. We were helping someone move into another apartment, and she come out and told the guy, "Why do you have these uh, title tales helping you?" When was that? I just, I don't remember. It's like was this after April 29th? Yes. Because you had told plaintiff about what you saw. Yes. Sit down. I have all the receipts and estimates for my truck. Would you like to see those? Yes. There was also medication stolen as well. Let's yeah. hope it didn't do any damage. I'm hoping. Judge Judy continues in a moment. Your Honor, can I speak? First, take your hand off your hip. Stand up straight like you're in court. You're not at a beach. Real cases, real people. Judge Judy. Michelle Loftus says she hired neighbor 14-year-old Robin Earhart to watch her apartment. Michelle says Robin and some friends damaged her home, stole personal belongings, and took her truck for a joyride. Go ahead. Um, when I took my cat to the vet, I had to take her that Monday because she was acting really sick, and um, they did blood tests on her and found marijuana in her blood system. What? And she also had a toxin in her blood system, and the vet said that that was probably from the candle that was left burning in the bathroom. Cross your arms. 
Your yeah, Honor, can I speak? Yes. Now, now I'm going to listen to you. But before you say anything, first take your hand off your hip. Stand up straight like you're in court. You're not at a beach. And before you give me a lot of crap, you want to tell me about that day, how the cat ended up locked in the bathroom, how 70 miles got put on the truck, and then we're going to talk a little bit about your friends can I and you making her life miserable over something you did. So we're going to talk about all that stuff. Now you can talk. First of all, when she called me, she did not tell me anything about the cat being in the bathroom. All she told me that there was a kennel lit in the bathroom. I'm asking you how the cat got locked in the bathroom. I don't know how the cat got locked in the bathroom. You don't know. How did 70 miles get put on the truck? I told you we used the truck to get No, you didn't say house. we. You said the two boys needed to shower. You didn't say we. Now you want to say we? I'm going to give you a chance. You want to say we used the truck to go get them a shower. Did we use the truck to go get them a shower? Or did they leave you there cleaning up after a steak dinner? I went with them the oh, okay. first so time. Okay, so you went... So the now there was... first time. Okay. And Listen. I sat in the truck to make sure nothing would happen to the truck. Gets better all the time. Miss Earhart, I want you to tell me how many disciplinary proceedings you've had with regard to your daughter in the last six months in school. Two. What were they about? She was probably going to school about three or four times, days out of the week. Since last September? Yes. Mm -hmm. She told me she was going to school. Matter, well, matter of fact, I didn't even find out about her truancy until the, the last quarter of her school because she was calling in for herself. Did you have a parent-teacher conference the first semester at school? Yeah, that was Did at you, the time that I, I had found out. That she was being truant and that, that she was, was being the first, truant. Within the first semester at school. Well, it would have been, you know, like third, in November. mid third quarter. No, that would have been first quarter. I'm talking about the first quarter. I'm talking about going to school for a parent-teacher conference the first quarter in school. No. Did you go? No. Okay. Is there any reason why you didn't go? I couldn't make it. They were t way too early. Okay. I just changed my mind, madam. It appears to me that the defendant, the older defendant, had knowledge that her daughter was misbehaving, or should have known that her daughter was misbehaving, if she had done what she was supposed to do as a parent, which is going to school and making sure that your child is in school, speaking to the teachers, being up on things. She didn't do that. She had an appointment. She couldn't make it. And you as a parent had the responsibility to say to her, before you hire my daughter and leave her in your home, I want you to not do it because I'm not quite sure that I can vouch for her. You got it? Yes, ma'am. Good. Judge Judy continues in a moment. Now, I am not holding her responsible for the things missing out of your apartment, because that is, well, probably true, a stretch. She is, however, totally responsible for the damage that was done to your truck. That's $1,330. And she is responsible for the injury to your cat, which cost you $34 at the vet. That's $1,364. And the only thing that I have to tell you, young lady, is you have to live in your own skin your whole life. She did nothing wrong. They did nothing wrong. I understand that. Well, if you understand that, then it's up to you to make certain that your friends leave them alone. I do not control my friends. I'm I just telling you, you may not control your friends, but if you are complaining to your friends that you got into trouble because of her, the morons that you hang around with will take it upon themselves to harass her a little bit. You wouldn't like it if somebody did that to your mother, would you? Listen, I'm not going to get through to her. I have a sense that she's a lost cause at 14. So why don't you do this? Why don't you change your number? Got it? We'll do. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Parties are excused. You may step out. <laughs> Judge 21-year-old Dora Speicher and her mother, Brenda Waters, are suing the father of Dora's children, Leonard Kiwi, for a loan to get his car fixed, the return of belongings, and pain and suffering. Who's Miss Waters? Miss Spicer, this is your former boyfriend, and you have two children with him. Is that right? Yes. How long have you been together? We were together a little over five years. How old are you now? 21. And how old are you? 24. So you were 19, you were a baby. You were... I was 16 when we got together. And how old are your children? Three and 16 months. According to your complaint, things in the relationship went south. 
You had gone to bartend at a party. Mr. Kiwi came to the party. He didn't like the way you were dressed. He thought you were being flirtatious. You even went so far as to wear makeup. There was an altercation, and you left. Yes. Him. Yes. Took the children, and you went to your mother's? Yes. According to your complaint, he refuses to return your personal property. Yes. That's what the case is about. And that personal property, you're talking about your clothing? Yes. And your children's clothing? Yes. What else? My daughter's TV and DVD player that my mom bought her for Christmas. Your daughter, who's three years old, got a TV and a DVD player? Yes. Get over it. <laughs> now, Mr. Kiwi, let's deal with this one thing at a time, sir. Do you have her clothing? No, I allowed her to come over on an agreement on December 23rd. They agreed to me that I wouldn't call the police on them, that they could, Shh, just... that they could come over. and. What uh, happened to her clothing? She came and got it with her mother and stepfather. What and about the children's stuff. clothing? She took some of it, basically almost all of it, and left me with like a couple pairs of clothes that don't even fit them. Did you go there with your mother? Yes, I didn't get all of my clothes. I still had some clothes there, and I didn't take all the kids' clothes. There's still clothes in totes in the garage that fit the girls. Well, I just, have... a, just a second. He's their father. Who bought the clothes? He did. My mom did. His mom did. His sister did. Well, he's a, you, you can't take all the clothing. I don't want all the have... clothes. You took some? Yes. Good. So, and some he has? Yes. Now, your clothing? Yes, I have... A few pairs of jeans over there, some more shirts over oh, there. You're talking about nonsense. You're talking about little stuff. What are you suing him for? I mean, I don't get it. You were together five years. We're not talking about a couple of pairs of jeans, madam. No, but they're mine. I should be able to get them. Well, do you have her jeans? I found one pair of jeans that was in the dirty clothes, and that's right, the only so, reason so she didn't So pack take it up them. and get it over to her. Yeah. <laughs> now, let's get to your mother. I can't stand to deal with nonsense. You say that you loaned him $1,000 to fix his truck. Yes. When? It was September 12th. What year? Did she give you $1,000 to fix your truck? No, she found a gentleman that, who at a bar who works on vehicles, but, and at first I was going to sell my Explorer to him, parted it out. Did she pay $1,000 to have your truck fixed? Yes. and but Okay. Now, it is your defense to that yes. that you had loaned her $3,000 a year before. Well, I, I took out a loan for $3,000 because I was $1,000 behind on rent. So I paid $1,000 on rent and I gave her $2,000 so their house would not be foreclosed on because they have took out like four mortgages on their home. When did you give her the $2,000? Before the Explorer was fixed. Do you have any proof of that? The only thing that I would have had was be like from my bank that say I paid off the loan, but unfortunately I didn't bring that because that's not paid off yet. Okay. Tell me how it came about that you gave her the $2,000. Tell me about it. Dora you know, I'm was, a good judge of what's true Dora and what's not. Dora uh, was crying and stuff, and I felt sorry for him because I thought we were family then, but I can see you, I guess we're not. And uh, I was just being nice and helping no, him out. No, tell me how she came about. Did she come to you and tell no, you she needed the money? No, she spoke to Dora, and Dora was telling Dora, me about it. Dora, look at me. When was it that your it mother was... fell? Look, look at me. I didn't ask finish the question yet. When did your mother fall behind in her mortgage payments? It was back in 2005, and he did loan her $2,000, but it wasn't from a loan. It was with his 2005 income tax. I don't care what it was from. It was 2006. Your mother said it was 2006. It was 2006. So, how much money did you receive from him? $2,000, and it was paid back in monthly payments of $500 a month, starting with the month of April and ended in the month of August. Show me. I gave it to Dora, and they paid their rent with it. She gave me cash. This was never brought up about the $2,000. This was prior. We would borrowed the money from him, and I only got one mortgage on my house. I don't have four mortgages. Whatever. You have four mortgages. You have one mortgage. He loaned you $2,000. When? It was in March. March of what year? 2006. And what month? Did she fix the truck? Uh, September of 06. Yes. And how much did you pay him back, according to you? I paid him $500 a month for four months, starting in the month of April. It was originally agreed that we were going to start paying in May the $500, but they were low on money at the time and stuff, so I started paying the money back in April. I paid them back $500 in April, $500 in May, $500 in June, and $500 in July. Did she pay you back any of the money? Uh, not all of it. How much did she pay you back? I'm not sure. She'd give the money to Dora, like she'd say, and then Dora would say that she was paying us, but I didn't see any of the money. In what month did your mother give you the first payment of $500? Around the 3rd of April, because we didn't have our rent money. And when did she give you the second payment? Towards end of May, because we spent it on my daughter's third birthday party. End of May. And when did she give you the third payment? 
sometime in June. I don't know when. And the last payment, I guess sometime in July. I don't remember the exact date, but she paid us back. And that's why she made the agreement to fix the Explorer for us because we were down on money then. Tell me how it came about that you paid this $1,000 for him. My daughter had called me. They, Scott also has a Ford Escort. It had Just tell me, your daughter called you and what? Their Ford Escort was broke down. Scott did not have transportation to go to work. She was upset because she didn't want him to lose his job because the Escort was broke down. I loaned him some money to help for parts on that, and then I said that I would pay for the Explorer to be fixed so that they would have two cars that were running because at that time Dora was trying to find a job so she could make income also. So I loaned him the money. I have a gentleman that I work where Listen I work. Listen to me. You have no contract with him, your daughter. He you was, know, just because, just because they're no longer together, which is what's happened, just because they're no longer together doesn't mean that you come to court and you claim things that really aren't so. It sounds to me as if he wasn't totally a bad guy. A little controlling, perhaps. You know you're a little controlling, Mr. Kiwi. Yeah. But it doesn't sound like he's a bad guy. He thought you were all family. He gave you $2,000 from his tax returns when you needed it. He didn't even ask to see the return of the money. You say you gave it to your daughter. She did whatever she wanted to do with it. She paid bills. She paid the rent. She did everything. She never showed it to him. And he was the only one working, right? So he was making a family. Just because they're no longer together and things aren't good anymore doesn't mean that you come to court over a pair of jeans that was in the laundry and fixing the truck so that your daughter would have a car and the boyfriend would have a car. She so never got now, the car. Now, do me a favor. Do me a favor. I have other things to do today. You have a counterclaim? Yes, ma'am. Well, your counterclaim says that you don't see your children. Yes. That's your counterclaim. Yes. That's for a different court, sir. Okay. Are you in another court about seeing your children? Yes. Do you see your children now? Every now and then, but it's a very big hassle because they will not take my children to the designated spot because it is not in writing. So since it's not in writing, they make me go to their house and they know I cannot go over there because I have an ex parte. And when I go over there to see my kids, they call the police. Her mother comes out and stepfather and tries to kick my butt. So I got ex partes against them as well. Her mother and stepfather. What arrangement? Uncross your arms. What arrangements have you made for Mr. Kiwi to see his children? We look, Don't look over there. We have called him, here. and my sister calls him at work because I can't speak to him. Calls him at work, tells him to meet my dad up the road at a store called Clyde's. He always makes an account. He doesn't have gas. He can't get to where it is. So my dad drives to Steve's, a gas station that's closer to him, and drops off the girls. When was the last time he saw the children? Two weeks ago. He's supposed to get them this weekend. And before the last visitation, when was the last time he saw the children? Two, Two weekends weeks. before that. Okay. Well, you're going to have to deal with the courts about that, Mr. Kiwi. You understand that? Yes. I suggest that you get whatever you need in writing, get it in writing. Do you understand? Yes. Very good. Okay. This case is going to be resolved this way. I want you to go into the laundry and I want you to get her pair of jeans that she left there, put it in an envelope and mail it back to her. Do you understand? Yes. Other than that, the case is dismissed. Goodbye. 56-year-old Candace Harris is suing her ex-boyfriend, 32-year-old Frank Boswell, for an unpaid loan and for trading in a Camaro that didn't belong to him. Candace claims Frank is a scammer. Ms. Harris, you met the defendant online. Is that how you met him? Correct, Your Honor. And according to what I read, you began a relationship with him. And at some point, according to you, you let him borrow a car that you had that you weren't using. Correct. And he had the car for many months. The relationship soured. You went to get the car and found out that Mr. Boswell had forged your name to the title of the car and either sold or traded it in for something else. That's correct. You also claim that you loaned him some money before this in 2005. And I'm telling you right now, Ms. Harris, I'm not entertaining that. Because according to what you said in your complaint, you sent him this money with the understanding that when he got back on his feet, he would pay you back. Correct. That's what you said. Mr. Boswell is going to tell me he never got back on his feet. <laughs> That's not a loan. It has to be objective, not subjective. Mr. Boswell will tell some people he's on his feet and tell other people that he's not on his feet. You have children, sir? Yes, I do. How many? One. That child live with you? No. You pay child support? Yes. As much as the mother of that child wants? No. Right. Because you're not really on your feet. See what I mean? Things are very predictable in this life. I could have written this script before I even asked him a question. Now, when did you let Mr. Boswell borrow your car? He came to see me on September 29th in uh, 2005. 
It was at my house for many months, being unused. So you let Mr. Boswell borrow it. What was the arrangement? The arrangement was that he would use my car. He was trying to get his career started in music, rap business, and it would be a nice car for him to drive with a little bit more prestige, maybe than what the vans he had. And we never discussed when I would get it back. However, in After March... he got on his feet. <laughs> yes. In March, I discovered there was other women involved in his life besides me who were also helping him out financially until he got on his feet. I could have also told you that. Yes, ma'am. And uh, it escalated to the point where more and more women started showing up. On June 20th was when he sold the car. I have the documents here that show now, it Mr. was... Mr. Boswell, how much did you sell the car for, sir? I actually didn't sell the car. I traded the car. How much did they give you for it? They just traded me another car straight across. Really? Yeah. But you forged her name to the title. I did that. You can't do that, Mr. Boswell. Why would someone give me a car and give me the title if they loan it to me? Who paid for the insurance? She did. And whose name was the insurance in? In hers. He got my message? It's her car. If she meant to pass title to you, she would have signed the title over to you, and then you would have insured the car in your name. Then why, now! Then why did she give me the title in the first place? Are you asking place? me a question, smarty pants? Yes, Don't you ask me a question, sir. I ask the questions, you give the answers. I want to tell you, you may find a lot of women that find you attractive. I am not one of them. Oh. <laughs> I can dig that. You, I'm glad you can. <laughs> what kind of car do you have now? Uh, 1990 Lexus LS400. How many miles did it have on it when you took 276. it? 276. 276 yes. miles? Is that your car? No, no ma'am. Her car, My car, her was, car a was a Camaro. It had 126,000 miles. It was a 95 Camaro. When I traded it, it had 143,000 miles on it. What's the blue book value of your car, madam? It is, Your Honor. It's $4,025. Is that in good, fair? That's the medium. It's in the good condition. Okay. Now, Miss Harris, you seem like a, an intelligent lady. I would hope so. You know the old saying, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck? Did you ever hear that expression? Yes, ma'am. If it walks like a deadbeat and looks like a deadbeat, it's a deadbeat. You're supposed to know the difference at your stage in life. Correct. Do you understand? Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $4,000. That's all. Bail bondsman Aaron McAllister says former client Elena Zedavich owes for unpaid bail money. What were you arrested for, Ms. Zedavich? I was arrested on false charges of domestic violence that my ex filed against me. I didn't ask you whether they were true or not true. I asked, what were you arrested for? I was arrested on allegations of domestic violence. Was it the first time you were arrested? Yes. Look at me. Was yes. it the first time you were arrested? The answer is either yes or no. Um, no. Better. When was the first time you were arrested? Several years ago. Having nothing to do with domestic violence? Has something to do with domestic violence. So you have two arrests for domestic violence? That's correct. Was it the same complainant in each case? Different. Different. Okay. You are a bail bondsman? Yes, Your Honor. It is your claim that you received a call from the defendant in jail. You responded. You bailed her out of jail. At her request, she promised to pay for the bond. She did not. You want your money? Yes. The defendant says you're a sleazy bail bondsman and she's not paying you. Correct. <laughs> when did you receive the call? Uh, sometime in the middle of the night from the county jail. What night? I'm not Karnak. What night would you like to tell me it is? <laughs> July the 15th. In the middle of the night, you were home? Correct. In bed. How did you get his number? Uh, it was posted on the wall in the county jail. Do you have your home number posted in the wall in county jail? No, ma'am. It's an office number that forwards to my cell phone in the evening and weekends. I see. I wouldn't think that you'd want your house phone no. to have a number. <laughs> okay. What did the defendant say to you when she called? That she was in jail and she had to get out. She had to get to work the next morning. If she didn't get out, she would lose her job. What kind of job do you have? I'm an executive assistant. For whom? For a small media startup. How long have you had that job? Close to a year. Ten months? Something like that. Where did you work before? Uh, I was managing a medical spa. Where? Walnut Creek, California. Okay. Have any family here? Just my two children. How old are they? Six and two. They live with you? Part time. Where do they live with the other part of the time? Well, my son lives with, uh, my daughter part-time lives with her paternal family. Maternal or paternal? Paternal. Paternal. Hmm? So the father's family, father's hmm. parents with her grandparents? No, his brother and his family, they, they live very close by, about 10 minute drive from where I live and she's there a lot because I work full time. Okay. So you had to get to work at the media startup company when you called him? Correct. Did you tell him that you were going to take care of paying his bail? What happened was I told him that I didn't have any money. 
No, no, no. When you yeah. called him on the phone from jail, you told him I don't have any money? Correct. Is that right? No. Of course not. Right. I wouldn't. Of course not, because if he tell you, please bail me out of jail, but I don't have any money, and he doesn't know you from a hole in the wall, he's not getting out of his warm bed in the middle of the night. Madam. Well, he did. No, no, no. He did. The question was, did you tell him that you didn't have any money? Yes, I did. He says you didn't, and I'm saying I believe him that at that time you didn't tell him I have no money, because if he's in business and he gets a call from a stranger, you are a stranger, right? Correct. That I want you to get up out of bed, drive over to the jail and bail me out. But by the way, I have no money. He'd say, call somebody else. That's exactly what I said. Uh, I don't believe you. Go ahead. We discussed that she had a CD and the CD was maturing within the next 30 days and that there would be ample That she would money, have money. Correct. In the CD to pay me out of the proceeds of the CD. And she didn't want to cash it in early because she didn't want to pay the penalty. I agreed to those terms within 30 days that she would use the CD. Was this on the telephone? That was on the telephone. Okay. Because you did ask her the question about money. Correct. And when you said, do you have money, what did she say? I have a CD. Okay. So, did you tell her how much the bail would be? Correct. 10%. $5,000. Because she had $50,000 bail? Correct. That's a high bail for domestic violence. It is. Do you know why it was so high? Uh, that's per the schedule in that county that's always 50000 for a felony charge. It was a felony? Yes. Okay, go ahead. So we get her out. We memorialize our agreement in writing. She Can signed I see it, please? a bail contract in the agreement to pay. Can I see it, please? Okay, so you signed an agreement to pay him the $5,000. I had no choice. He made me sign it. <laughs> but but you Madam, you you listen have to me very carefully, madam. You have a choice. Your choice is to stay in jail until the matter on which you were arrested for is tried. That's your choice. You your chose... Honor, you had a different agreement. No, no, no. This is your agreement. This in here is your agreement, in the four corners of this agreement. And what I asked you was, did you sign this agreement? And the answer is either yes or no, not yes, I was forced I to sign. Yes, I did sign that agreement, but aside from that, there was an oral agreement that took place between me and Mr. McAllister. I'll get to you in a minute. Okay. Go ahead. Once the agreement signed, I get her out of jail. She says, now what do I do? I live 30 minutes from here. I agreed to give her a ride. She's worried about getting to work, so I give her a ride. And it's about 30 minutes away. So during that time, she tells me the entire story about the arrest. And I attempt to be understanding that, you know, she was arrested and I'm sorry and it's a bad thing. And you're dealing with a breakup and, um, you know, how she caught her boyfriend with his new girlfriend laying on the couch that she paid for or she picked out. And the entire time in the Would car, Would you look at me when you're telling me this story, Mr. McAllister? Look at me. Don't look down there. Sorry. The entire time in the car, she says, I'm not a stalker. I'm not a stalker. Go, okay, sorry. You're not a stalker. No problem. Okay, I'll get you to your vehicle. Well, the vehicle's parked three blocks away from the house where she was living or where she was arrested. So there's obviously something going on there. Anyway, I get her out. She signs the agreement, and she refuses no, to pay just me. just a sec. When did she sign the agreement? Immediately upon release from the county jail. Okay. And then you drove her to her car. Correct. And you dropped her, and she never paid you. Right. I made repeated When, for the attempts. first time, did you contact her with regard to payments? Well, within 10 days, we sent her an invoice, just a reminder of the payment terms, and sent her four or five subsequent invoices that went answered with these rambling letters talking about... Do you have a copy of the letters? I do. Can I see them, please? Those are her letters to me and then my responses. Based upon our discussion, these are your words, when he initially asked you for your money. Based upon our discussion, it was my understanding that we would discuss my opportunity to provide some type of service to you and your business in lieu of paying you $5,000 for a relatively risk-free, as you put it, bond. I am still awaiting the opportunity to make good on my offer to work for your company. As you were advised at the time the bond was posted, I have not, or do I have now, $5,000 fee that you are demanding. Given the above-mentioned discussions that we had at the time of the unsecured bond was posted, I now consider your correspondence demanding $5,000 to be intimidating and threatening. What are you, crazy? <laughs> Please do not send me any more threatening letters. You knew my financial predicament at the time bail was posted. I still intend to honor my promise to perform professional services for you. You never promised to perform professional services for him. Your you own letter discussion. says 
It was my understanding that we would discuss my opportunity to provide some type of service to you or your business in lieu of paying for the bond. Given the above mentioned discussions that we had at the time, I now consider your discussions well, are on a contract, let, madam. Let me tell you what happened. Yeah, because he's not telling you the whole truth. Go what ahead. happened? He bails me out. Are you knows, just a second? Are you telling me the whole truth? Listen, are you yes. telling me the whole truth? Yes. Really? Yes. About your children's living arrangements? You're telling me the whole truth? We're not talking about my children right now. Oh, I right. want to tell you. You mean you're telling the, the truth? truth? Listen happened. to me. You're telling the truth sometimes, and sometimes you can lie. And when am I supposed to tell the difference? You see, I knew that you were lying to me about your children's living situation. That you're not willing to discuss. What, what do you what Listen did I to lie me. about? Listen to me. My question to you is, how am I supposed to tell when you're lying? And how am I supposed to tell when you're telling the truth? I do tell the truth. But you just lied to me today. About what? You lied about your children's living situation. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. How did I? Oh, yes, you did. And you know you did. You know that they live with me part-time. They live with some part-time. They live here because I work. That's not the story. But that's a story you chose to tell me. Now, you told me that with the same veracity as you told me that you had another contract with him. And my question to you is, how am I supposed to tell when you're telling the truth and when you're lying? What I'm saying is the truth. Okay. Now I'm going to hear you and then I'll tell you what the law is. Okay. Well, he bails me out. He drives me to my vehicle. On the way to my vehicle, uh, he makes comments about me and he says, well, it would be nice if um, a pretty woman like you worked for my company doing some sort of marketing and uh, promoting my company and uh, maybe we can work something out in terms of paying for the, bo uh, for the uh, bail bond that he posted on my behalf. So when he dropped me off by my vehicle and before he left, he made me sign the agreement that you saw after we had the conversation of me potentially working for his company. Did you get what you said to me, madam? You just said to me, maybe you could work for my company. Maybe you could work for my company. And that's not an me. agreement. No, he, that's and, and not. That. No, 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 no. After that, nothing. You took that. And I believe that you said that to her. Well, maybe you could work for my company and do something. Maybe you said it to her. Who cares? It's not relevant. There was no I contract. I said I couldn't work for him full time as he proposed. It took, so he no, no, said, no, 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 madam. You can work something out and you can work for me on weekends. Oh, listen to me. Listen to me. You're making it up as you're going along. No. Yes. No, I have you a are letter. Because according to what you said to me, after you had that discussion, after, not before. You see, he said you signed this at the jail. No. You say I signed that after I had the discussion with him, about working with him part-time, weekends, etc. If that was true, that's not contained in this agreement. No. And I believe, madam, that you are one smart cookie. And if he had this conversation with you where you made a contract with him, a contract that's enforceable, to work off the bail bond by working for him part-time, you would have put it in this agreement because you're already out of jail. You see, you're already out because you're already bailed out. So then you could either say to him, I'm not signing this, or you say, it's not the entire agreement that we have, but you didn't. You signed it and said, I promise to pay you $5,000. Well, he told me right there that if you don't sign it, I'm just gonna put you right back to jail. That's what he told me. I don't believe you. You're making it up as you're going along. No. You're making it up as you're going along because if he said to you, you sign this or I'm going to take you back to jail. That's what he said. Your response would have been, well, then put in our agreement that I could work it off. Right? Right? I was very stressed. Oh, and I listen, it's not the first time you were arrested. Signing. That's why I asked you the question before. You know, it's I, not the first time. It's probably not the second time that you were arrested. So pay him his money. 23-year-old Cami Farmer is suing Jose Martinez for a late-night fender bender outside a nightclub. Jose says it was Cami who backed into him. Ms. Farmer, you claim that Mr. Martinez damaged your car in a parking lot, and Mr. Martinez says that the accident was both of your faults, so you should each pay for your own damage. You were all exiting a club that evening. Right. So what I'd like you to do is to go over to that chart that you prepared and show me where the exit was. This is the exit right here. Okay. So there's a steady stream of traffic that's going sort of in the center. Right. And what happens is I assume that a car in the center lane lets one car in from one side and then another car goes sort of there was alternating 
egress right. from the parking lot. And there was um, police officers in the parking lot directing traffic. Now, what kind of car were you driving? A 2000 Chevy Malibu. And Mr. Martinez? A van. So tell me what happened. Um, as I was trying to exit... That was you. You're in the red. This is me. I'm the red and he's the blue. So as they're exiting and I'm waiting in line for them to exit, I guess he got impatient and was in a hurry or whatever and tried to go around me. And his back van door was open. So as he's trying to go around me, his door caught my left bumper and my left tail light and shifted my trunk. You have pictures of that? No, I don't. I put it in the shop the next day, so I didn't take pictures. Well, after his van door hit your car, what happened? The police officer directing traffic directed us to pull this way and exchange information. And you did that? Yes. You have a police report? No, um, because it was on private property and there was no injuries, the police officer didn't take a police report, but he gave me a statement. I'd like to see it. This is police officer M. There were 20 vehicles in the parking lot attempting to leave. Okay. So what I want you to do, sir, is to give me your version of what happened. Well, because you know. I will tell you now, Mr. Martinez, the police officer observed what happened. Okay. So before you even think about trying to fabricate a story, I suggest you think hard about what happened. Okay, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, well, at night, uh, me and my friends threw a party at a uh, club in Union City. I don't care. And, uh, Listen to me. I don't care. Get to the parking lot. Okay, the parking lot. Okay, like look I say. look at me when you're talking. Okay, we was partying. You know, everybody had a little liquor in them. Not me. No, just a second. Okay, well. You had a little well, liquor in I had a little liquor in me. So I'm like, uh, we was exiting the uh, parking lot. And uh, could I show you on the ground? All right, this is, this is the parking lot. I guess this is how you get out. I'm right here, she right here. I'm going up. When I was coming up, she was coming back. So we both hit each other. The reason I didn't really find no collar claim because I figured it was both our fault. No! That's why I did that. Well, where was I going? That, just a second, just a second. Get back there. Okay. First of all, you had no business being behind the wheel of a truck or a van or a vehicle if you had been drinking. Yeah. Because it clouds your judgment. Right. And let me tell you what the police officer said. Okay. The police officer said, he observed a black van with its passenger side sliding door open as it was attempting to drive around Miss Farmer's vehicle. In trying to do so, the black van side door collided with the right rear taillight of Miss Farmer's car. Mr. Martinez continued driving along the side of Miss Farmer's vehicle, causing more damage. It appeared that Mr. Martinez did not realize that he collided with Miss Farmer's vehicle. You know why that was? I realize. That. All right. So let me see an estimate, please. I got um, two estimates. The shop that I went to gave me a, a discount. Okay, but you had it fixed. Right. Well, how much did you pay to have it fixed? Eight hundred and twenty-seven sixty. Here's the receipt. Good. Great. And I'm surprised that is the police officer didn't cite you for driving while under the influence of alcohol. I also have rental car um, receipts because I had to get back and forth to work, and I also had a daughter that needed to get back and forth to school. Who do you live with? I live by myself. I'll see them. The receipts are um, in my mother's name because she rented it, but I gave her the money, cash. All right, the judgment's for $970. That's all. Step all right. out. Thank you. Daycare provider Samantha Burks says former client Lillian Linton owes for breaking their contract. Lillian claims Samantha left her kids unattended in a parked car she is countersuing for child neglect. I've read your complaint, which alleges that the defendant breached a written contract that you had with her for child care. At some point, she terminated your services, you say, without good cause. She owes you some money. And in addition, she filed false charges against you with Child Protective Services, which required them to investigate your home, investigate whether or not you should continue to be licensed as a child care provider. Yeah. Ms. Linton says that she took her children out of your care because you placed them in a situation that could have been dangerous. And she is counterclaiming yes. for the potential harm that you did to her children. So when did she take the children out of your care? On the 1st of July. Tell me what monies you allege she owes you. Um, I'm alleging she owes me all that is paid through the county. She called me and gave me a two-week notice and didn't fulfill it. She gave you two weeks notice when? The day after in question. I guess it would be the 2nd of July. 
on or about July 1st. Well, I'll tell you a little bit previously, um, because I had not been keeping her kids. The end of school had come, and so we started making arrangements again for me to start keeping her children again. Miss Linton leaves her children home alone. I only was keeping her youngest son. Shh. I just want to know what happened on 7-1. Okay. The damn question, I picked her children up. How many children? I picked all four of them up. How old are they? They're 13, 9, 6, and 1. Is that your son? Yes. How old are you? 12. Is that the one that you said was 13? Yes, I was told he was 13. You're 12? Yes. 12, 9, 6, and 1? 12, 8, 6, and 1. Okay. All right, so you picked up her children, four children. I picked up her children, and the, and the day in question, I had, to have, I had a class I have to take. There are certain requirements through the county that you have to take classes. So I had a class. Um, Lori McMillan's a friend of mine, and I have her watch them. She's watched her kids many a time before. Is Miss McMillan a licensed daycare provider? No. Are you permitted under your contract with the state to leave the children with unlicensed daycare providers? Yes. You are? Th that, that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. I've never... Shh. Listen, I don't need any help, and this isn't a tea dance. Not that you're aware of. Not that I'm not aware of, exactly. Oh, okay. So, Ms. Burks, did you have to take classes in order to be a child care provider? Yes. You... Did they do a background check? Yes. Criminal background check. They did fingerprinting? Yep. Photographing? Yep. So you went through a process before the government says we will pay you money to watch children. To get my license, you go through that process. That's right. Mm -hmm. To get your license as a child care provider, you must go through this process. Yes, ma'am. She didn't go through the process. Okay. So nobody has to tell you that she's not permitted to take care of the children. No. I'm telling you that unless you are vetted by the state so that you can get a license, you can't give over the care of four children to somebody else. I understand that now. Good. What happened next? Well, I, I haven't even gotten to the beginning of that day because I, I would like to tell you the whole day. I want you to tell me what happened when you left the children in a car. That's what that, this that's, is all that's about. That's what I'm trying to get to. Well, they get there. Okay. On the day of question, I picked her children up. I went to the county building, had some paperwork to drop off for my father. I take care of my father, who was terminally ill, dying of cancer. Um, after that, I went and picked up Gloria McMillan to watch the children for me. On the way home, I stopped past the party store. Getting out of the car, I said, guys, you guys wait right here. I'm going to run in the party store real quick. Let my daughter pick out her party invitations. And we proceeded into the store. I left her children in the car. And on my way out of the car... Where was she? She went into the store to speak to a, a friend of hers that worked at the uh, register in the store. How old is your daughter? My daughter is two now. The daughter who was picking up? Yeah. I have a very bright two-year-old. Just a sec. What two-year-old could be in? I'll give you this last opportunity. Then you're going out. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Yes. So let me understand this. First, you went to take care of some business for your father, who you take care of. Mm hmm And you took the children with you. Mm-hmm. Had this lady been watching the children yet? No, she that was day? not with me. Just a second. Who was with the children when you dropped the paperwork off? I was with the children. Did they come into the county building with Actually, you? No, they stayed outdoors and played. I never thought any of this would be a problem at all, Miss Linton. Well, Miss Burks, it's a problem. That's what we're doing now. I'm and going I, over the day. I understand. I'm this going over the day because it's getting worse as no, we go this forward. No, it's already worse. I understand what just, I did was completely just, wrong. Well, if you understand that, then Miss Burks, I don't quite understand why you're here. Because from what I'm I read in the complaint... Ms. Linton is slandering my name. Just a second. If what you're telling me is you picked up her children and you had your two-year-old in the car, you went to the county building, mm -hmm. did you take your two-year-old inside with you? To the county building, yes, ma'am, and her son. Shh. And her 12-year-old or no, her one-year-old? her little son. They stay outside Shh. and play basketball. The you went inside and you took your two-year-old and her one-year-old into the county building. And her other three children stayed outside alone. And played the, on the playground. I don't care where they played. They stayed outside alone. Yes, ma'am. And then you come back to the car and you went and picked up this lady. Yes. And then two adults, your daughter, went inside to a store and you left her four children in the car, including the one-year-old. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And how long were you in the store? Maybe five minutes. So that's what the case is about. It was the next day that she called and gave you notice. Right, but that's not what she called me and said the next day. What did she call you and say the next day? She called me on the phone when I answered. I said, hello. She says, I'm giving you a two-week notice because you have a problem with my son. I said, no, ma'am, I don't have a problem with your son. Your son is a child. You're a liar. No, no, no. Listen to me. Miss Linton, 
Don't speak to her. Okay, go ahead. I said, no, ma'am, I don't have a problem with your son. Your son is a child. Your son has a problem with following adult supervision. And this is not the first incident that I had an issue with her son. I said to her, your children were throwing rocks. And I asked them to stop. When I asked them to stop, her son looked over at me and said, I'm not throwing rocks, just like that, with a handful of rocks. So I said, I'll just call your mom. Um, when I called her on the phone, she said, um, let me see if I can remember her exact words. Uh, they know I don't play that. I'm going to beat that when they get home. I said, OK, I'm just letting you know. It's not acceptable in my house. People have nice things around here. I don't want to be responsible for anything that happens. And that was it. We got off the phone. Later that evening, I had to have my father rush to the hospital. I was under a lot of stress. Her kids were still outdoors, not paying me any mind, not listening to anything I said. And um, when she got there, you could see the agitation in her face, you know. Where does your um, father live? He lives with me. Ms. Brooks, your plate is too full. I agree with you. I agree. I agree with you. Now, when you accept the responsibility of taking care of someone else's children, you have to take care of them sometimes better than their own parents take I do. care of them. I did. No, no, no. Listen to me. If you have five children, I made a very big mistake and I would never do it again. You have learned five, listen to me, I'm not even going there. The car, totally, 100% unacceptable. And she had every right to, to call Child Protective Services and say, you left four children in the car, including a one-year-old child, and I'm complaining about that. I never said she was wrong about she, that. What she's wrong well, about you, is that she wants to point the finger at me when she's a bad mother herself. She leaves her children home Ms. daily. Burks, Ms. Burks, listen to me. If we were involved in some other forum, I would say to you, fine, we can vent upon who's a better mother, who's a bad mother, who's a good mother. We're here because you sued her for two things, for money for child care mm -hmm. and for filing a false report mm -hmm. to Child Protective Services. Mm -hmm. Whether she's a good mother, whether she's a bad mother, whether she's a wicked stepmother, whatever she is, she did the right thing by calling Child Protective Services to report that you had left the children alone. Your plate is very full. When you accept children into your home as a child care provider, you're supposed to do more with those children than just be a body there. You're supposed to play with them. You're supposed to provide them with activity. With Are you. you. No, no, I no, 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 listen to me. No, no, what I'm telling you is, if you have a two-year-old toddler yourself, and a father who is terminally ill with cancer that you're caring for in your home, it is impossible to set up a home, your home, to be an appropriate and adequate child care provider. Well, so, Judy, that's your opinion. I disagree. And my father was not diagnosed with lung cancer when I took care of her children. Through the process of taking care of her children, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. You told me the story, madam. You said I had to drop some papers off for my father who was dying of cancer, who I was also caring for. You told that to me. But you're saying to me. I'm saying to you both. In general. With your own day. children. That day. Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay. That day. That's all you need is one day. That's all you need is one day to miss a child. You know, they missed a couple of children on another coast, and they ended up in the trunk of a car. I have to investigate myself. Let, There's a listen, lot of bad things that listen, happen to children that get left in cars, and I'm absolutely. very aware of it. Absolutely. Ended never, up in trunks ever, of a car, and they ever, didn't get them in time. Do it again. So what I would never do it again. So you don't belong in court, Ms. Burke? Yes, ma'am, I do. Ms. Lulinton is going around town saying bad things about me. I am not a bad person. Just a second. If you have information or witnesses that she's saying anything about you scandalous that have to do with other than your child care abilities, I'll be more than happy to hear witnesses to that. What do you mean? Well, I don't know what, if she's saying things about you, about your personal life, that you have a disease, that no, you're a thief. No, she's basically in a nutshell saying that I'm a bad person. Her, her exact words was that I'm not cracked up to all that I'm supposed to be. Listen to me. That's her opinion. And she can say that, and not all speech is actionable in a court. What you did as a child care provider was wrong, so you have no basis to sue her for either the money that you claim she owes you or for calling Child Protective Services. None. She's got a counterclaim. Yes, I do. Your counterclaim is that she left your four children in the car. Yes. Were any of them hospitalized? No, they weren't just, hospitalized. Just listen to me. I have questions. Any of them treated by a physician that day or the next day? No. Okay, so they suffered no injury. Who are you? I had the kids the following day, and the one-year-old was um, throwing up two to three times. You're a liar. And I have never seen this one before. She did not have the one-year-old the next day. I kept her me. son overnight. I am a licensed just I kept her son speaking? overnight. I want to say one, two, three. So far, you have no case. That's fine. I, I don't care if I don't have a case. Good. She will not sit here on national TV and lie about me. I kept her You're son overnight, you liar. liar.
Miss Burks, I've already explained in a calm fashion why I'm dismissing your case. That's Ms. fine. Miss Linton, yes. you have no counterclaim against her. You have no proof that her actions caused illness to any of your children. You were perfectly within your rights to take them out of her care. Her illness and I'm speaking. I'm speaking. And you were perfectly within your rights to call Child Protective Services to report the neglect. Other than that, you have no claim against her because her actions, while they placed your children in potential harm's way, did not cause any injury to your children. Your counterclaims dismissed. She puts That's her all. Step out. Every She's day. a liar. Home alone. Liar. That is bird. Excuse me. Step out. That's it. Tracy and Steve Thompson are suing Tracy's son, 22-year-old Terry Frost, for a loan to buy a motorcycle, bail money, and impound fees. Mr. and Mrs. Thompson, this young man is your son? Correct. My son. Your and stepson? Yes, ma'am. I gather you feel he's been a little bit irresponsible. A lot, yes. You co-signed for a motorcycle for him a couple of years ago. Correct. He stopped making payments on the motorcycle. Correct. You took it into your custody. You have the motorcycle. Correct. It was going to be repoting. So you made all the payments on it so well, far? Correct. When the bank called in regards to being repoed, um, our credit would be, you know, in, in bad Jeopardy. Way. Exactly. And so I asked TJ, you know, why aren't you making payments? So then he said at tax time he'd be able to make up what I've already paid and take over payments at that time. But he didn't. Correct. Oh, so now you took a motorcycle back over a year ago. Um, uh, oh, four, correct. It's been sitting in my backyard. Okay. Who has the title to it? Um, I actually got the title. I got it last month. It's actually in his. Great. Name. I have pictures of the bike, too, if you'd like to see it. I assume you... No, he actually didn't. He laid it down, and then um, it's, like, all dismantled, and apparently he blew out second gear. I don't know what all damage is to it, but... Okay. Have him sign this over to them, please. Your Honor, I, I really don't want the bike. Then you shouldn't have signed for him. You shouldn't have taken it back over a year ago. When you took it back over a year ago, madam, what you should have done is gotten it, sued him, and come to court immediately. You know, now what you have to do is you have to sell it, and if there is any shortfall between that and what you owe on the bike, you may be able to sue him again. But right now, you have to take the bike and you have to sell it. Now let's talk about the bail. You well, bailed him out again over a year ago. Yes. Tell me how that came about. Uh, he called one night. He had gotten a DUI, and I went down the next morning and bailed him out of jail. When was that? Um, the late of 03. In 2003? Yes. So two years ago. Yes. When did you co-sign for this bike? Uh, in 2002. And what was he driving in when he had a DUI? Uh, another car of his. Did you call them? Yes. Did you tell them you were going to pay him back for the bail? I just asked them to bail me out of jail. And they did? Yeah. Were you working? Mm, no. How'd you expect him to pay you back? Whenever he got a job. There are loans, and then there are what we call great expectations. <laughs> I would assume that when he called you and said, I'm in jail, come and get me out. You said, I'll be right down. Right? Not quite, but... What did you say to him? I reluctantly went down. Right. Because you love her. No, actually, I was not going to bail him out because that was... Oh, that would have been very smart. And... I wouldn't have bailed him out. Well, and then he Maybe... felt sorry for me. And this and was in 2003. How old are your children? Two and eight months. Oh, at least he might not have had one. He makes a lot of bad choices. Correct. Isn't that right, sir? I guess, yeah. What do you mean you guess? How old are you? 22. You're 22 and you have two children? Yep. And how old is the mother of these children? 21. And where does she live? With her mom. And where do you live? With my aunt. That sounds like a wonderful family. Now, you hesitated for a moment, Mr. Frost, when I said you've made some bad choices. Let me explain to you what you've done. In your short period of time, you've probably screwed up their credit. Are they rich people? No. Well, you stuck them with a motorcycle loan. Right? Right. You stuck them with your bail. Right? right? You stuck perfect strangers with taking care of two babies. That's your girlfriend's parents that she's living with. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I guarantee you at their stage in life, they didn't anticipate taking care of two infants. Because not only did you make one mistake, but you couldn't keep your thing in your pants long enough not to make two mistakes. And you say to me, you have a question as to whether or not you made mistakes? Yeah. You have a question? No. Good. So you could have avoided the whole thing by saying, you know, I was a dumb kid. Okay. Dumb kids make dumb kid mistakes. They don't make babies. Right. Not two. What do you work for now? 
That's uh, not a question that requires a lot of thought. You have two babies. For uh, Tom's tile maintenance. You work full time or part time? Part time, and I go to school full time. Where do you go to school full time? Davenport University. What kind of school? I'm going for medical. You want to be a doctor? Not a doctor. A nurse. Thank God. <laughs> do you see your grandchildren? Um, I do now. There was a period that with this loan, I didn't see him for about seven months or something like that. And then he had a second baby, and I ended up going to the hospital and seeing the baby. And, you know, he has since told me, you know, him and his fiance are paying off her parents some money. And I think he owes me this money for this bike. I want him to pay me for this bike because I didn't I think, want and the I bike think, And I think that with. morally he should do that. Yes. I just told you the legal right. result of what's going to happen here today. Right. If your son chooses to take the moral high road, that's up to him. You paying the maternal grandparents of your children some money? I'm not. My fiance is. For what? I don't know. Whatever they loaned her. What do you spend your money on? He Baby gives it stuff. to her. Well, that's good. Right. No, I agree. That's She's good. A that's blessing. fine. She's a blessing. That's fine. Somebody's got to exactly. support these exactly. babies. Exactly. She's a blessing. She keeps things straight. So you give her money? Yeah. How much? My whole check. And what do you give to your aunt? Nothing. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Thompson, put a lock on your checkbook. Right. Yes, Done, Dan. Good. Goodbye. Jean Johnson is suing her daughter. 28-year-old Christine Lettler for two unpaid loans. Jean says her daughter is taking advantage of her. Miss Johnson, this young lady is your daughter. Yes. Your complaint alleges two loans to your daughter, and she yes. has repaid neither. Correct. Your daughter says that her family came on hard times. You were kind enough to offer her some money for housing. She accepted your offer, which was a gift, not a loan. Yes. Tell me about the first amount of money that your mother gave you. Uh, my mother had given us $2,000. When? April, I believe. Why? My husband was the owner-operator of his own business, a uh, trucking company, and uh, we're from Massachusetts. It's very, it was very snowy this winter, um, so his work slowed down quite a bit. And then he had to have major surgery on his colon, and um, that put him out of work for a couple months. So things were very bad for us, you know, uh, mortgage-wise. So we decided that, you know, it might be better for my husband's business, trucking, to move to Florida. That's always sunny there. You don't have to worry about missed days. Um, so, you know, we found a house and, and that we liked, and she gave us the money. I didn't give the money. Okay. Just a second. Wait one second. Tell me about the call that you got for the $2,000. Well, they did have hard times, and she did call me, and she needed some help with the deposit on the house that they were going to get in Florida. I was against it. You know, I didn't want my grandson going all the way to Florida. You know, you're a grandmother. That's true. And I told her I would loan her the money, but I needed the money back. It was When did you I'm... expect her, and how did you expect her to pay it back? She, her house was on the market, and she had promised to pay me back after May 26th when she sold her house. Now, when was the next loan? When was the next amount of money that your mother gave you? I, I'm not sure of the exact dates, but, you know, we did talk about that, and she knew that we were on hard times. Um, and when we, we did get an offer on the house, it was less than what we had expected. Well, how much did you get? Um, we got about seventeen grand. Unfortunately, due to being behind, you know, my husband had to catch so up. So you on netted seventeen thousand dollars in profit. Yes. And how much was this second amount of money that your mother gave you, and for what? She had found us a rental house in Westboro. Uh, every time I would go over to her house, I would get. Well, the, the first house fell through in Florida. Well, that was a to build for us to own. Um, she had found us a rental house. Why did house. it fall through? The builder had been put to a halt in Florida. Um, he had too many outstanding projects per the person that we were going through. So you lost the $2,000? Yes. Yep. Um, so she had found us a house in Westboro. She gave the woman the money to secure it so we'd be in the same town as her. And I knew that she knew that we had no way of paying her back. I, was, I couldn't pay my mortgage. How was I going to pay her back all this money? It's ridiculous. Out of the sale of the house. Well, I, uh, that's just the thing, Your Honor. I mean, everybody else that, you know, my husband had his truck that he owned, which was quite a lot of money every month, so we had all these pay. And, you know, we owed money to his parents. I mean, it, it was just out of control well, this How much winter. money did you owe to his parents? <laughs> we owed his parents $5,000. They got their they money. Sh did you pay him back? Yes. Did your mother know that you had paid back your husband's parents? Yes. What does your mom do for a living? She works in an office. And your father? My father's a retired policeman. So he has a pension? I believe so. 
And your in-laws? Uh, my father's a retired state policeman. Your father-in-law? My father-in-law, excuse me, is a retired state policeman. So he has a pension? Yes. And your mother-in-law? Uh, I believe she works at TJ Maxx still. They have comparable kind of incomes. Why would you choose to pay back your in-laws and not your mother? Because it's my mother and because she knew that we were in difficult times. I mean, my husband had to go back and take a job working for somebody again. He had to sell the truck ultimately because we couldn't afford to pay for it. Well, so now you go from making this much money to making this much money and all these people that you owed, they really don't care. They want their money either way. So trying to raise an eight-year-old and... Ms. You know Leffler, I understand you and I am compassionate to your position. And to be quite honest with you, unless your parents had their back to the wall and needed this money desperately, I don't think I would have pursued this matter in a court. I'm telling you right now, Ms. Johnson, I would not have done that because I think that your daughter, she strikes me as being a reasonable person. But I think, Mrs. Leffler, that you could have handled it a little more reasonably and said to your husband, listen, we have one pot of money. We have $5,000 that we're able to scrape together to pay back our collective parents. And we can't pay them all back what we should together. So let's work it out and give each set of parents $2,500 and say, you know, we're going to try our best to put some money together so that we will have the respect of both sets of parents, not just one. Well, I really didn't think that she wanted, I mean, I didn't think it was a loan. I really didn't. Well, but she, listen, you, you know? can't tell me that the first time you heard about it was when you got served with a small claim summons. This is something that's been going on for a while. And I'm going to suggest to you that... Your mother might have let this slide for a longer period of time until she found out that you paid back your in-laws $5,000. Because, quite frankly, that would irritate me. You say to me, it's a very interesting thing. You said to me, it's because it's my mother. What well, can I say that uh, she didn't want the money until she, she decided she wanted to pay off her second summer car. She's got a nice Saab convertible. Not really something you need to have, but she has it. So, you know, I, I have to give her this you money because she wants to pay her car off. Just a minute. That's not your determination to make. But all of a sudden it's... What do you do for a living? I work in an office. Same as your mother? Mm -hmm. And your husband's working now? Well, he's working for somebody now. He's not making the kind of money he used to. Well, he's working? Yes. And you have one child? We do. When did you pay back your in-laws? Uh, when we sold the house. You owe your mother the money. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $4,000. That's all. Crystal Hardison is suing fellow motorist Robert Jarvis for vandalizing her Ford Explorer by kicking it. Crystal claims her mother witnessed the incident. Ms. Hardison, what kind of car do you drive? It's a 2005 Ford Explorer. Uh, 95 Mitsubishi Galant. What was the date of this incident? June 2nd. And you were going into a drugstore to get a prescription filled? Exactly. And what were you going to do there, Mr. Jarvis? I was pulling in to get her, a, um, my fiance, a drink and a candy bar. Was she with you? Yes. And you were both going to the same store, so you pulled in first? Yes. And it is your claim that Mr. Jarvis intentionally not only spit on your car, but also dented it? Yes. Mr. Jarvis says he might have spit on it, not intentionally, but he certainly didn't dent it. And your mother was with you? Exactly. And my 11-month-old son. Well, he's not here to testify, but your mother certainly yes. is. When you went into the store, Miss Hardison, mm -hmm. your mother remained in the car. Exactly. And when you went into the store, did your fiancé remain in the car? Yes, ma'am. She pulled in first. She was already parked. Tell me what she was doing, Mr. Jarvis. Well, as I was pulling in, I was waiting on her for about two to three minutes while she was brushing her hair with the door open in the parking place. So you were waiting to pull in because she had the big door open for this SUV, brushing her hair? Yes, ma'am. How long were you waiting? Two to three minutes tops. Did you honk the horn? No, I was just sitting there waiting to get in, being patient. Why were you brushing your hair? I'm pretty vain. So before I go anywhere, I always put my makeup on, brush my hair. You were going to pick up a prescription. Exactly. And I'm just, that's my nature. If I'm going to a local store, I'll put clothes on, put, do my hair, and put my makeup on. Hadn't you done all that before you went in? I sure did, you but I just wanted car? to make sure everything was straight. Didn't you see Mr. Jarvis waiting for you? At the time that I opened my door to get my brush out my purse, no, I didn't. But there came a time when you did see him waiting for you. I saw a front end of a car behind mine, yes. And you continued to finish brushing your hair, and then you put the brush back? No. Once I saw the front end of the car, I said, oh, he's waiting, and I closed my door and went directly into CVS. What happened when you came out? I got to my driver's side door, 
and I saw there was spit on the window. I opened my door. I said, Mom, somebody spit on my window. And she can tell you the rest. Step up, please. What is your last name? Duranti. Tell me what happened that day on the 2nd of June in the parking lot. Okay, on the 2nd of June, my daughter had to go to the pharmacist to pick up a prescription. And uh, she got out of the car, opened the passenger side. That's we, uh, we cut past the fact that she okay. was brushing her when hair she, to make sure she looked perfect. Okay. So, yes, never know who you're going to meet in the pharmacy. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Okay, Crystal came out. She says, Mom, who spit on my car? I said, don't worry. I got his tag number. I was sitting in the car on the passenger side watching an incident on Route 1 to my right, and I see this man walk up to the car and just cover the window with spit. I said, I'm going to get his tag number. I went to get my purse. I went down to get my purse. The whole car judged you just Shut. like Yes. I looked up. I saw him. I heard his door bam, slam. He was going. He closed his door and walked behind his car and got into the driver's side. Okay, and so a passenger door slam, and then he walked around to get into the driver's side? Yes. And the passenger side door was where your car was? Yes. Got it. Now, do you have any proof of damage to your car? Yes, I do. Because, Mr. Jarvis, I'm going to save you the trouble, sir. According to your answer, you were having sinus problems that day, so yes, you spit. Yes. You don't know where it landed? No, I didn't have no intention of <laughs> spitting on a vehicle, no. It was just a bad sinus. Yes, I had sinuses. <laughs> and and that. you caused no damage to the plaintiff's Absolutely car. Absolutely not. Now I'd like to see the. F okay. See, I'm going to save you. Save you all that trouble. <laughs> Your car's green. My car's green. But your boot is damaged. And besides, my car door don't go that high. It's it may not have been your car, sir. It's and I was never on that side of the vehicle. I was driving. Mr. Jarvis, what you're asking me to do is to say to this lady that she's lying. Now, common sense, which is really what we're about here, suggests to me that you were annoyed at this young lady. No, actually, I wasn't. Well... I was being patient. Well, listen. Then you are... The only one I know who, under those circumstances, wouldn't be annoyed. I would be infuriated. But to be cussed Infuri and belligerent. Just a minute. I would be infuriated if I was sitting there patiently and somebody was not just putting a baby in a car, because that you wait for, you know, adjusting a car seat or whatever, but somebody standing there with an open door, primping and brushing their hair while I'm waiting to get into a parking space would rile that out of me. I can't even tell you what it would do to my husband. <laughs> Can I speak for sure. Can I have her come up? If you want to. I'd just like to say that night when the police contacted us, the only thing that they said was that he spit on the window. When he called back to the police department, the police officer said that this was ridiculous and dropped it. 30 days later, we received it stating that there was damage. Why that night? Was there no record at the police department? I have no damage? idea. Maybe they couldn't see it. And she drove all the way home and the spit stayed on the window? Listen to me. I mean, that doesn't what? make any sense. Does she listen to me? Free idea. money. That's I'm what speaking. You're to get. Does she look psychotic to you? <laughs> no, no, listen to me. Not the daughter who was primping, who <laughs> has to comb her hair before she goes to pick up a prescription. <laughs> I'm talking about her mother. I'm going to tell you, I'm a nurse. People are psychotic listen all the time me. and they don't I want Listen this. to me. Well, <laughs> listen. I've been around twice as long as you have. This lady is not psychotic. This lady did not take down your tags and report this matter to the police because she was having a psychotic episode. That's my judgment. Now, let me see how much it costs to fix your car. Okay. I have two S's. You have a 10-year-old car. $578 for Windex is a little ridiculous. Oh, so that has nothing to do with Windex? There's no dent caused by him. That is definite. That's just trying to get free money what it is. I never got out that car, so nobody was ever on that side of the car at any point. I was in that passenger side of that car. Nobody suggested that you did any damage to the car, madam. Cheaper of the estimate is $369.80. Is that right? Yes. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of three sixty nine eighty. That's all. Well, that Ashley Coggins says she loaned money to ex-boyfriend Daniel Piper so he could buy a 1990 Mustang. Ashley says Daniel has never paid her back. Ms. Coggins, according to the complaint that I read, you and Mr. Piper lived together for a period of time. Yes. And you took out a loan. Yes. And the loan was to be primarily used for a car for you. 
What kind of a car did you buy? Uh, 1990 Mustang. How much did you pay for it? $3,200. How much of a loan did you give him? $4,500. What'd you do with the rest? Well, she got a portion of the money, approximately three to $400, and the rest of the money I used to plate the car and insure the car. And then shortly after the loan, the two of you broke up. Yes. He made some payments on the loan and then stopped. Yes. You want him to pay the loan? Yes. Mr. Piper says that he was forced to sell the car, stop making the payments because you moved out of the apartment, leaving him with the lease and the bills, and he couldn't do everything, so he stopped making the car payments. Well, I paid some payments. I did not. How many payments did you make? I believe four. And in what amount? Uh, 122 and some change. Does that sound right? I believe he made four, but only $55 have been made since the payments were always late and they were adding the interest and the payments were always late. He's only actually paid $55 on the loan. Can I see the last statement, please? Yes. So I can look at it. Well, the balance is 444520, but some of this is yours. Right. Well, let's say there's $4,000 left on the loan. Now, did you both sign a lease for this apartment? Yes. yes. When did you sign the lease? March of 2004. And when did you move out? I moved out July of 04. Are you still in the apartment? Yes. What was the rent on the apartment? $735 a month. And what was your financial arrangement with the, regard to, to the rent? I was supposed to pay all of the bills, the electric and the cable and the cell phone bills, and he, him and his brother were supposed to pay the rent. They were, were supposed three to three of you living it. there? Yes. Is that right? Uh, my brother did move in, but we were not splitting the rent. That wasn't the agreement. Yes, it was. Shh. Why not? Due to the fact my brother had just got back from the Navy. He was in a tight spot. He needed a place to live. I let him move in with us under the agreement that he would pay $200 a month. Is he paying $200 a month? Yes. Then you're almost whole, sir. If the rent is $735, let him pay half the rent. He's not in a bind anymore. I understand, but he's right? also not on the lease. I don't care whether he's on the lease or not. He's living there. Yes. I mean, your defense to this whole action with regard to the car is that she left you with the lease, which I would take into consideration, except for the fact that you moved your brother into the apartment and he could pay half the rent. I mean, he's a big boy. Yeah, but what was I supposed to do when she left the lease, didn't have somebody else move in? Listen to me very carefully. Okay. When you moved into the apartment together, mm -hmm. the two of you, in March of 04, did your brother move in with you? Yes. At the same time? Yes. Really? Yes. With no agreement that he was to pay at least a third of the rent? No. The agreement mm -hmm. was $200. Well, you better change the agreement, sir. Circumstances change. He's living there with you. Now, put your hand down. You sold the car. Correct. Two. Kid named John. Did you put a sign in the window? No, I didn't. Well, how did you sell it? The kid came to my mother's house where the car was parked in the backyard. He had them get a hold of me because he wanted to purchase the car. You mean he just, it was like Karnak? He said, oh, this must be a, 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 a car that's for sale? Well, the person that I bought the car from was friends with this kid. He was looking for that kind of car, so he came to me. How much did he pay for the car? How much did he pay for it? That's my question, sir. It doesn't give you an opportunity to think about an answer. I, I, I just you should know that you. you should know that like that. Yes, Don't he, play with me. He paid eleven hundred dollars for the car. Why didn't you give the, that eleven hundred dollars to her? Why would I give it to her? Well, who's supposed to pay this loan? Me. But you haven't been doing that. At that time, I was still paying the payment. But then you stopped. Correct. So why didn't you give her the eleven hundred dollars? Um, because I was paying the loan at the time it was But then you date. stopped! The $1,100 by that point was gone. I mean, the situation I was in, I didn't this? have... this? is my girlfriend. What is she here for? Because she's been the one dealing with Ashley during this whole thing. Why is she dealing with Ashley? Um, because I because repeatedly... Because he refused to talk to her. I repeatedly asked her not to call me. If she needed to get a hold of me, I asked her to ask her mother to call me, no, to email me, not or oh, to have... I don't want to hear you unless I ask you a question. Okay. I repeatedly ask. I'm her getting not to frustrated call me. with you, Mr. Piper. Okay. I I'm getting frustrated with you, Mr. Piper. Somebody takes out a loan for you. You promise to pay them. You stop paying them. You sell the only equity that exists, which is your car. Well, to tell you the truth, the car wasn't part of the loan. Well, what was the loan for? I'm saying there was no. That wasn't collateral on the loan or anything like that. Okay, this loan was just a is personal that, loan. 
payments. It wasn't money. a car loan. I understand what it was, sir. Okay. She took out the loan to enable you to spend $3,200 plus tags and fees to buy a car. Correct. Of course I'm correct. You think you're smarter than I am? No, ma'am. On your smartest day. You're not as smart as I am on my worst day. Okay. What do you want? I was wondering if I could say something. Of course. <laughs> I haven't had lunch. Well, Danny was with Ashley for throughout their whole high school career. I don't give a listen to me. I, I listen to me that. carefully. I don't give a rat's behind whether they were soulmates in utero. Okay. He took money from her. I understand listen, that. Why, try to be quiet and watch my mouth. He took money from her to buy a car. He stopped making payments on the car. He stopped making payments to her for the loan that she took out to enable him to buy a car and then he has the goal to sell the car and not give her the proceeds she lived with Danny was very unsatisfied with whatever Danny did what left did not pay any rent didn't pay anything asked him oh she is always in contact did you pay the rent did you pay this did you pay that if you walked out you are supposed to find someone to take your place she did not You're do on. that I, I, she left Danny with Everything left him with the rent, the utilities. He had shut off notices. Listen to me. A me. roof over Listen his head is me. more important than a loan payment. When that my she mouth starts to move, yours is not moving. Do you understand? That? Yes, Your Honor. Danny has a brother, a big, strong guy who served his country, who came back, and who now has a roof over his head, cable, gas, electric, rent, and these two boys have to manage to pay $735 rent. And they can get that by collecting cans if they need more money. His brother, if he is trying to find a job, can go and work in a fast food place for minimum wage. You can make $350 a month doing that. He has no right not to pay his debts. And if you are making excuses for him... I'm not. Good. Then he... he does Hello everyone, welcome to my Hedy YouTube channel. I hope you all guys are well. Let's play Hedy. So guys in this video we will check out the new valley season here. I have seen that the new valley season has started and it's here for a short time and a little bit changes are there and I have not played the valley per se we have reached the goal in just two or three days and that's awesome and now I will play and if I need to win that core decoration then we have to collect some of the tokens I have not collected any tokens and here I have seen a chicken there there are so much chickens I think at that place I can see a chicken here and then the, a chicken is there and there there are so much chickens there in the game okay that's cool awesome so let's get, get that full fuel okay previously there was seven six seven eight and nine fuels now they have changed it to nine ten eleven and twelve and that's awesome they have changed the fuels there and then I think they have changed many things in the game here I can see the normal shop we can see some exclusive decoration there or not it's a path or ditch okay the things are normal there and 30 diamonds and 10 diamonds good decoration this is also the same thing and people are delivering the gods there and here how to play welcome to the valley and the details are there how you can play the valley valley shop and the tokens okay that's cool awesome first of all the information is about the welcome to the valley then everything starts with the fuel then what to do on the valley your personal quest and then find the chickens and then the valley shop and then the tokens that's cool 
so these are the daily quest and here is the information about the daily quest welcome to the valley okay this is the same thing there and daily tasks are there we need to complete these tasks daily wise and we can win these boxes we can open these boxes and the lucky bonus is also there we can play that lucky bonus also after completing the daily quest and today's quest is we need to move towards a dinner visit one dinner then drive seven buildings or road steps stops and then complete three x order requests and complete one group order request these are the daily tasks and here we have a uh, the chicken or uh, our truck there and then now we need to collect some of the tokens i think the amount of the tokens are higher okay the truck is faster we have collected a chicken there and the truck is so much faster and we have they are giving us more tokens i think in short the valley is a little bit easier they have decreased the time duration for the valley and they have changed they have increased the tokens amount that we can get after completing the request and they have fastened our truck they have speeded it up so we have finished our fuel and previous now these are the daily tasks they are showing up as the daily task we need to complete one truck order and then we can get two tokens two sun points and then feed five cows okay then catch four x fish and then we can get 10 x of the sun points they have increased the amount of those also and here we have got open uh, box a free box so we can get those free box rewards from the daily quest we can win that decoration that diamonds and that, that those boosters and then we can buy or purchase the items from there also from the normal valley shop so we need to collect tokens so much tokens we need to complete that task and the tasks are there to come send the trucks we need to okay we need to feed that cows i think to get the sun points or yes i'm right we have shortage of soybeans there now let's okay i will go with those first and then the, I will plant those soybeans and I have shortage of the carrot also let's plant that carrot also and now we need to we have completed two of the tasks you guys can check out the task from there also let's send one more truck there and we will get two points there yes we have got two points and now we will collect the fish four fish will give us 10 of the sun points and these sun points will help us to get the fuel let's catch the fish after making the lures there okay here we have completed those one and two and three here you go okay now here we have started catching the fish one done we have not got the points and now the second after catching the fourth fish we will get 10 of the points every day these tasks changed there on the board we can check out the tomorrow task also i will show you 
right now after catching four of the fish third time third i am catching the third one and the last is now remaining here you go okay it's done so we have got 10 of the fuels you guys can tap here and you guys can check the farm pass and now you guys can check here and check you can collect the or see the sun points in the fishing area also you guys can check the valley in your town area also by tapping on the farm level and then you guys need to go on the sun point area on the third area so now we need to spin the fuel and i am hoping to get 14 13 or 12 of the fuels and here we have got the 12 fuels here now let's move our truck to get those tokens so you guys can collect the amount of tokens that is shorted in your total now i have pink tokens red token shortage there and now i will move towards the red token and i will not move i will not try to move towards the both of those okay still i am have seen the red token there in that order and now i need the carrot there is not any carrot in the newspaper so that's for now in this video we have checked out the new valley season they have changed many things there in the valley they have shortened the time of the valley and now the valley is a little bit faster and cool and we need to to play it faster so that's for now see you in the next video till then take care bye bye and please subscribe my head youtube channel bye all